Good afternoon. I take this opportunity to welcome members to the second remote meeting of Sefton Council's Planning Committee. And I would like to extend a special welcome to members of the public who may be viewing this meeting online. This meeting is being held using Microsoft Teams live events software. A protocol for members attending remote meetings has been circulated prior to the meeting and I would respectfully request that all members adhere to the protocol. Members should also refer to the remote meeting voting protocol to be followed in respect of each item. If members or officers, members or officers are called to address the meeting, could they please pause for a few seconds to enable the microphones to be unmuted and the cameras to be turned on. Members are requested to keep the cameras off and microphones muted when they are not addressing the meeting. For members of the public viewing this, there will be delays in between individuals speaking. And I apologise for this, but it's due to the technology that we're having to use. Unlike a normal meeting, there will, we, will, we won't be relying on PowerPoint presentations on screen. And all committee members have copies of the agenda and plans, and these will be referred to by page numbers where necessary. For members of the public, this documentation is all available on Sefton Council's website. Okay, before we commence the agenda, can we have a roll call of members and officers and their role at the meeting, please? Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Blackburn, just confirm your presence. Councillor Blackburn, can you turn on your mic? Sorry, I thought I had. Present. Councillor Dodd. Present. Councillor Dutton. Present. Councillor Friel. Here, I've done member. Councillor Kelly. Present. Councillor McCann. Present. Councillor Brenda O'Brien. Present. Councillor Michael O'Brien. Present. Councillor Pullin. Present. Councillor Roach. Present as a member. <clears throat> Councillor Ann Thompson. Present. Councillor Lynn Thompson. At present. Councillor Tweed. Present. Councillor Waterfield. Present. Councillor Beedman. Present. <clears throat> Chief Planning Officer David McKenzie. Present. Legal Advisor Neil Kennard. Present. Planning Manager Steve Matthews. Present. Thank you. Um, Transport Planning and Highway Development Officer Stephen Birch. Present. Senior Engineer Flood and Coastal. Um, sorry, Flood and Coastal Management Sam Dimber. Present. Principal Environmental Officer. Um, <clears throat> Health Officer Greg Martin. Present. Team Leader Development Management Kevin Baker. Mr Baker. Can you confirm your presence? We'll move to the next officer. Senior Planning Officer Stephen Healy. Present. Senior Planning Officer Diane Humphreys. Present. Senior Planning Officer Neil Mackey. Present. And I will just check again for Mr. Baker. Kevin Baker. Kevin, can you please confirm your attendance? I can see you there. Mr. Baker's microphone does not seem to be working. Um, if you can leave the meeting and return, Mr. Baker, we'll confirm during the meeting that you're present. Okay, Chair, back over to you, please. 
Thank you for that, Mr. Hanson. So we're moving to the agenda. Apologies for absence. I've received apologies for absence from councillors Hans and Murphy. If anyone wishes to offer any other apologies on behalf of colleagues, could they indicate now using the chat facility, please? And it doesn't appear to be. We've lost the live link, I think. You're back on. You're back on. You're back on. Okay, thank you for that. Just an IT glitch, I think. So we'll, we'll start item two again. Item two on the agenda, declarations of interest. If members wish to declare the disclosable pecuniary or personal interest in respect of any items on the agenda, could they please indicate the wish to do so using a chat facility in Microsoft Teams, please? Councillor Dodd. Thank you, Chair. Predetermination 5E and F86, Middle Lane, Southport. I will not take part in the debates and I will not be voting, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Dodd. No one else has indicated, so we'll, we'll move on. Item three, minutes of the previous meeting. These are the minutes of the meeting, 10th of June. And as a committee's decision that I signed, the minutes as a true record. Agreed. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, the reports at items 4A and 5A on the agenda refer to applications for which petitions and ward council representations have been received in objection to the developments. The petitioner and ward councillor have been invited to submit written representations of no more than 650 words, setting out the reasons for the objections. The applicants have also been asked to submit written representations of no more than 650 words in response to the petitioner and ward councillor representations. These written submissions can be viewed at pages 3 to 14 of the supplementary agenda pack. To ensure that planning committee is fully appraised of the representations received, the respective petitioner and world council representations and applicants responses will be read out by Mr Matthews, the planning manager for the petitioner and world council submissions and Mr Neil Kennard, our legal advisor for the applicant submissions prior to a decision being made on each application. In accordance with the Council's constitution in respect of the petitions items on 4A, the Ward Council's representations will be heard last and will therefore be read out after the, the petitioner and applicant statements. And being mindful of the committee's usual etiquette, a five minute cut off point for the oral representations will be used. I'll indicate if necessary when the four minutes 30 seconds is reached and when the five minutes is over. As the petitioners, ward councillors and applicants are not present at the meeting, members will not be able to ask questions on the submissions. That brings us to item 4A on the agenda. This relates to Liberal Ramblers, Moor Lane and Crosby. And I'll ask Mr Healy to introduce the report. Thank you, Chair. For ease of reference, the plans and photographs for this application can be found at 7A of the agenda, which is pages 157 to 160. Uh, the committee report itself is at page 9. The application seeks outline permission for the erection of six dwellings on lands currently occupied by the car park of Liverpool Ramblers Football Club. Access and layout are applied for up front. Appearance, scale and landscaping will be agreed at the matter stage. The application is subject to a petition opposing the development, which is endorsed by Councillor McGinnity. An objection has been received from Thornton Parish Council, along with objections from eight individual addresses, including one received late yesterday. 
The main issues to consider are the principle of development, access and highway safety. The application site is designated as open space with local plan policy NH5 protecting sports uses and their ancillary facilities such as parking. The loss of parking facilities to non-sporting uses will only be deemed acceptable if it is demonstrated that they are either surplus to requirement or where equivalent or better facilities are provided elsewhere. In saying this, the applicant has submitted a concurrent application for the layout of a new car park towards the rear of the Ramblers site um, in place of disused tennis courts. This is also being considered by committee under item 5A of this agenda. It is recommended that the two applications be bound by a section 106 legal agreement, which ensures that replacement parking provision is provided. On this basis, the outline residential proposals are deemed to be acceptable in principle. In regard to access and layout, the proposal would utilise and improve the existing access point of Moor Lane and run behind the rear of the six dwellings, which in turn maintain the prevailing building line along Moor Lane. The council's highways manager has assessed the proposal and has raised no objection on highway safety grounds. Considering the, pro the proposal would generate a limited number of additional vehicle movements within the locality. <coughs> um, there would also be no detrimental impact on the existing bus layby. One of the main grounds of objections relates to the presence of a covenant on the land. This is not a material planning consideration. However, the late representations clarify that the decision to relax the covenant has already been agreed separately through appropriate legal means. Concerns have also been raised over the consultation process and COVID. The Council has carried out consultation in accordance with the adopted statement of community involvement and issues surrounding COVID are explained fully in the committee report. All other technical matters have been resolved or can be adequately addressed at reserve matters stage or pursuant to the conditions set out on page 18 of the agenda. Subject to the completion of a section 106 legal agreement securing replacement parking facilities, the proposal is considered to be acceptable, policy compliance and is thus recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Mr Healy. Okay, a petition in objection to this application has been received from Mr Brian Booth, who submitted a written representation setting out the reasons for his petition. Mr Booth's re written representation can be viewed at page three to four of the supplementary agenda pack. Mr Matthews, our planner manager, will now read out the representation submitted by Mr Booth. There appears to be a brief technical problem trying to get Mr. Matthews live. If you just bear with me a second. Chair, we appear to have lost Mr. Matthews. Oh, he's back. He's back on that, yeah. The poor, poor, poor connection seem to be back now. You're live, Mr. Matthews. Okay, can you hear? Yes, yeah. you can be heard. Can you hear me now, Olaf? I can hear you. Um, your video is not going live, but we can hear you. Okay, shall can I go I, ahead now? Can I intercede here? Um, 
we have um, a person that's emailed me during the course of the meeting saying that he's hard of hearing and that he wants to see people's lips while they're speaking. So I assured him that people would be shown on screen when they when they were addressing the committee. Obviously, I'm not, but. Can you try to reconnect to the meeting, Mr Matthews, because um, your video is not coming through? Yep, OK, I'll hang up and try. OK, so. We are just waiting for Mr Matthews to reconnect. OK, is that coming through now? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. You're now live, Mr Matthews. <clears throat> Apologies for the uh, poor connection there. Many residents who live on Moor Lane, myself being one of them, were concerned that the Ramblers Football Club had submitted planning applications for development of six houses, reference number DC 2019-02088, and a car park on the tennis club, reference number DC 2020-00423. We already have had to put up with very congested heavy traffic, traffic flow issues, high noise levels, and high levels of pollution that are not adequately monitored, which likely exceeds the safe levels set out in national and EU legislation, also air quality being the chosen theme of Sefton 2009 Public Health Annual Report. The proposed development of six houses on the Ramblers would only add to traffic problems, noise pollution and a very serious risk to health to residents and users of Moor Lane and other roads in the area the heavy pollution levels which we breathe in daily. At the start, if the development goes ahead, construction traffic, then additional cars, service vehicles, visitors vehicles will add to all this. Add on the development of other planned developments in the area, all traffic eventually ends up on Moor Lane and supporting roads. Also, there is an issue of road safety the development of a junction for the proposed access road to the development very close to an existing pedestrian crossing and bus stop. The junction to Edgemoor Drive, which opposite to the Ramblers, has recently been closed off for safety reasons, which a new junction is now being proposed. The junction to the development entrance is blind to people approaching from the Holy Family side. The pupils from Holy Family who cross the entrance on the cross-country run they carry out daily will not see traffic emerging. There is also a risk of localised flooding caused by paving and concreting over green space and the lack of improvement to the draining system as shown within some recent development in the local area. The two planning applications involve each other according to the plans submitted by the Ramblers the housing development will be gated. The access to the playing fields will have steel railings fitted 1.8 metres high and close, closed board timber fencing 2.1 metres high and a controlled access gate across the playing fields and tennis club. Stopping people who have used the open space for many years, the open space land has been used daily by children playing with their parents, teenagers playing football, dog walkers, cyclists and walkers, all from the local area. The access to this open land will be stopped by the development. At the entrance to the Ramblers, there is currently a traffic bar. To the left of the traffic bar is a space for access for the public. During the current pandemic, it has been of great use to a high volume of local people. A restricted covenant was put in place at the time of the sale of the land to the Ramblers by Sefton MBC, which stipulated that the land must be kept as open land for sports and recreation use. Question. The planning application for the tennis club to car park number DC 2020-00423 stipulates that this application requires wider publicity 
Has this been carried out during the pandemic with local newspapers not in circulation? As the local people don't seem to be aware of the planning application, as I have already said, both plans involve each other. That's the end of the statement. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr Matthews, and thank you for battling the IT as well. Um, we'll move on to the applicant's submission. The Pool Rambers AFC have submitted a consolidated written representation in response to Mr Bood's representations and also Councillor Carragher, Ward Council's representation. The applicant's written representations can be viewed at pages five to seven of the supplementary agenda pack. Yeah, as is normal with planning committee, as there's a ward council representation, the uh, allowance for submission or response is doubled. So there's up to 1300 words and the time allocated is, is obviously longer as well. Mr. Kennard, our legal advisor, will now read out the applicant's submission. Thank you, Chair. Um, whilst this statement is as much as possible a focused response to the statements referred to in the header above, it must be emphasised that all points made are inherently interrelated with planning application reference DC 2020-00423. The interrelated nature of both applications has been considered as critical throughout the application process to ensure that both applications can be assessed under current planning policy. We have worked closely with the case officer throughout the application process to ensure that all planning policy is strictly complied with. Background. Historically, the genesis of this planning application is the result of an on-site inspection by an officer from Sefton Council, who met two of our members at the request in relation to our concerns over the poor condition of the long disused tennis courts. The overgrown state of the tennis courts, vandalism of the tennis pavilion were pointed out. It was clear that antisocial behaviour was rife on the site. There had been fires set in the old pavilion and there was drug equipment lying around. The officer made it clear the council did not have the funds to carry out any remedial work or in fact make the site safe. During this meeting, a solution was discussed and even encouraged that the Ramblers purchase the site and use it as a car park to be financed by building on our existing car park. We are aware of the restrictive covenant, but there was enough common ground to pursue the objective leading to the application which we now present after three years of careful negotiation. The terms of the agreement were put before the whole council on the 22nd of the 11th 2018 and the minutes of this meeting show that it was approved unanimously as subject to planning consent. The restrictive covenant. In relation to the matters comprised in the 1987 conveyance of the Ramblers land we confirm the following. One, the restrictive covenant benefits the council as land owner and the commercial terms have been considered and agreed for its partial release so that the development can proceed if planning permission is achieved and the council are to receive monetary consideration for its release. Although the council may not have been minded to release the covenant in 1994, this does not preclude the council's landowner from deciding to do so now. This has been considered over some time and negotiated and agreed. As planning authority, the council do not benefit from the restrictive covenant and only do so as landowner and therefore it is in their capacity as landowner that they can agree to or refuse to release the covenant and on what terms. Two, there is a right of preemption in favour of the council affecting the Ramblers land in the 1987 conveyance. This provides an additional means of protection for the council in that if the land in question were to be sold, it must be first be offered to the council to acquire it. The council do not have to acquire the land, however, and have one month to decide. In terms of any acquisition by the Council in the 1987 document include reference to the price being agreed on the basis the restrictive covenant affects the land. Therefore, this right of preemption also needs to be released together with the covenant and the Council has agreed to its release in view of the consideration to be paid. Further to this, our rules as a club prevent any member of the club itself from profiting from any further sale or development of the club and expressly provide that on disillusion no circumstances shall the net assets of the club be paid to or distributed among the members of the club. No member shall obtain or benefit from any such assets of the club. Instead, they provide for distribution to local organisations with aims similar to our own or failing that the fields in trust charity. Highways. This application is minor development. We have worked with the council to ensure that the proposal is acceptable in terms of 
of all aspects of hiring policy applicable to this type of development, including all aspects of highway safety. We understand that Edgemore Drive was closed off because drivers frequently used it to avoid the traffic lights at the Audi Junction to speed through the adjoining estate. Ramblers Junction is already in existence, does not permit onward passage to anywhere else and is considered acceptable by the council's case team. Our existing entrance is currently used on a regular basis by our groundsmen and visiting teams. No visibility issues have ever been raised and no incidents or near misses have, to our knowledge, ever been recorded. The surfacing of formation of the modified turn off of Moore Lane will follow the proposals of best practice as described in various guidance documents, including manual for streets two, to ensure change in road use priorities is clear when entering the development, thereby ensuring the safety of all road users. Social contribution. Okay. Um, we note the concerns of both Councillor Carragher and Mr Booth that the general public will not have free access over our football pitches. Those objections perpetuate the local view that our private piece of land is open to all for any use at any time. We have never had problems with responsible people who walk their dogs on a lead and in fact have had many amenable conversations with some regulars. However, we have for many years been blighted by people who do not keep their dogs on leads and allow them to foul our pitches, which is not only very unpleasant, but creates a health hazard and opens us up to the risk of litigation from opposing teams. We have also suffered numerous incidents of vandalism and many attempted breakings in our clubhouse. We have always been very happy to allow local supervised societies and clubs using our pitches and pavilion, and in recent years we have welcomed a Stuart, sorry, Crosby Stuart ladies football team to use it for their home games. St Mary's old boys to host a team from Stuttgart with their own pitch was available, unavailable. A local junior team coached by one of our members which trains there during the week. A local archery team who were given free use of the site to use when required and numerous charity football games. We would be more than happy to contribute to accommodate local teams and organisations who are supervised. We'd also be happy to make access available to the regular responsible dog walkers, notwithstanding the fact that this is private property. What we wish to eliminate is the mindless and inconsiderate who spoil it for everyone by controlling access to our grounds in the same way that Holy Family School have done recently to their playing fields. The proposed housing will introduce an extended zone of active frontage with the associated benefits of natural surveillance, which will contribute to minimising antisocial behaviour in the area. In conclusion, as a club, we understand our responsibility to contribute positively to the neighbourhood of which we are a part. As such, we feel that our proposals represent the best opportunity to solve obvious existing problems of environmental health and antisocial behaviour associated with the existing state of the location, as well as ensure the Ramblers can continue as a club for generations to come and thereby continue to contribute to the ongoing sustainability of the neighbourhood. In conclusion, we ask the committee to approve our two applications in the knowledge that implementation will solve many significant existing problems in this location. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for that. And finally, in um, submissions on this application, Councillor Carragher has submitted the written representation and objection to the application. Councillor Carragher's written representation can be viewed at pages 9 to 10 of the supplementary agenda pack. Mr Matthews will now read out Councillor Carragher's submission. I am writing in support of the local residents of Thornton and their objection to the building of houses and a car park on the land of Ramblers Football Club. Firstly, I would like to bring to the attention of the Planning Committee to a restrictive covenant of the said land of the Ramblers imposed by Sefton MBC that the property should not be used for any purpose other than a football recreation ground or as a ground for athletics or for the playing of such other games as may be permitted by Sefton, whose consent should be evidenced in writing. This covenant was the subject of planning permission back in July 1994, when Sainsbury's PLC showed an interest in the land. This was the subject of a resolution by Councillor Les Byram at full council on the 31st of May 1994, Understanding Order Number 25. 
and full council resolved that the council would not be minded to change the existing preemption pre clause or the restrictive covenant at this time to permit any development. My question to the committee would be, when did full council rescind this resolution, discharging or modifying the restrictive covenant contained on the transfer of the 18th of June 1987, which states that the transferees shall not within 80 years from the date hereof sell or otherwise dispose of the land. May I refer the committee <clears throat> to the case of Hopcroft 1993 and a reference number given as 66 PCC.R.475. In relation to the more local issues as stated by residents, this development would increase traffic to the local area which suffers from severe congestion, hence the Thornton Corridor study. This is an area which suffers detrimentally from heavy traffic and in the last few years, local councillors have had to make significant changes to the area to allow traffic to flow more easily, closing a cut through road, Edgemoor Drive, which is directly opposite the development and making modifications to the Thornton Crescent. This development will create increased traffic congestion and pollution to the area that is already at threat of high levels of pollution and to irradiate a further green space in the area will not help to reduce carbon emissions, thus contradicting Sefton Council's green clean agenda. Public spaces, given that we are hopefully at the end of a global pandemic, the limited green space that the borough of Sefton has, has proven to be a lifesaver to most of our community. Thornton has a number of residents who live in flats and have no access to a garden. During this trying time, local people have newly discovered their area and have taken to parks and green spaces, the Rambler site being one of them. We are very lucky to have these hidden gems in our area and to take a further site away for un unaffordable housing in a gated community would be detrimental to our residents' mental and physical health. We need to preserve our sanity and health going forward if we are to survive this pandemic. Finally, this development is earmarked to be a gated community. This is again not what Thornton is about. This development sets out to isolate itself from the rest of the community. This is not in keeping with the local area aesthetics or the idealisation of the people who live within this community. This is an open community with open spaces. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Mr. Matthews. So we've heard the representations. We'll move to consideration of the report. Over to members. Can I ask members to indicate if they wish to speak on the chat facility, please? Councillor O'Brien. Look at the red lines here. Yeah, I am now. Thanks, Jay. Um, I've got a couple of points. Um, we know that the the covenant is not a material consideration. But as I seem to remember, Sefton Council took a very clear uh, view on any land that it was involved with will not allow gated communities. This is a gated community. That's point one. The other one is, um, I think I heard Mr. Healy say that the um, the bus lay-by won't be affected. Well, no, the bus lay-by not, might not be. But if you look at the, the pictures we've got of where that bus stop is, compared to where the entrance to this development's going to be, you get a bus pulling in there, nobody will be able to see to the right as they're coming out of that development. Um, and then there's the other one of, um, we've got six properties that are gated, and then we find out that 
two of them are going to be classed as on a normal road. But the far four are on a private driveway, although it's all one continuous um, road. Now I can understand it if the four were off to the right or to the left, you could say that could be a private um, driveway, but this isn't, it's straight through. So for now, Chair, I'd like a few answers for that one, please. Okay, I've got Councillor Dutton's indicated to speak, but before I bring Councillor Dutton in, I'll ask officers to respond to the issues that Councillor O'Brien's raised. So. Um, thank you, Chair. In terms of the question regarding gated access, um, the plan on page 156 of the agenda 158 apologies um, shows that it would there would be um, a controlled access to to the six houses um, this would wrap behind um, behind them and I don't believe that in terms of the perception of, of of the estate it would it would read uh, as a gated community um, the the old front mall in um, with modest boundary treatment towards the front which this indicative plan shows would be um fencing of one meter in height so i believe th the main purpose for that gate to the rear is security reasons um but i do i do appreciate um councillor o'brien's comments in terms of the other considerations um i think the largely in relation to visibility, highway safety and whatnot, and possibly um, they might be directed um, better towards uh, Mr. Birch through you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor. Um, if I could just uh, touch on the bus stop initially we've had uh, conversations with Mersey Travel and uh, Councillor is quite right there may need to be some modifications to the bus stop to ensure that uh, adequate visibility is provided but Mersey Travel are comfortable that those modifications can be made and would be required as part of the um, highway works associated with the development so um, yeah, that there would need to be some modification, but no material impact on the bus stop in the sense that it, there will still be a bus stop there and it will still be available for use. In terms of the private driveway, um, I, I understand your um, concerns and also the the appearance of the plan does, does appear to be slightly confusing. Uh, as members will be aware, last year we modified the um, guidance in our developers pack um, removing any reference to shared surfaces and reducing the number of properties that can be served by a private driveway to four. Uh, and in this case, um, there are four properties served by the private driveway. The distinction that there is um, in terms of what the distinction between what you might call an ordinary road and the private driveway is that the ordinary road has separate uh, provision for pedestrians. So on the plan that uh, Mr. Healy referred to on page 158, you can see that there is a separate uh, footway for pedestrians that extends um, around the first property past those first two properties. So where there is a separate footway, that is considered to be uh, an ordinary road and the private driveway only starts once the separate footway provision uh, ends. Um, the other thing point just to make in relation to this um, is that as far as I understand at the moment, we are not proposing to adopt any of this uh, roadway from the entrance. There may be a little bit at the entrance to ensure that the existing footway along Moor Lane and the connection into Moor Lane would require adoption, but the rest of it will be a private road but not a private driveway until the pedestrian facilities, the footway ceases uh, past those first two properties. I hope that clarifies that for you, Chair and Councillor. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Dutton, waiting to come in. Yeah, thank you, Chair. 
Um, my my concern is in is again in relation to uh, to the bus shelter. Uh, now this is possibly one for reserved matters, but if you look at plot five, the bus the bus shelter is right opposite it, and I would say, having dealt with something like this in in the past in Formby, there is an element of overlooking here. Um, could that be addressed? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I think that would be addressed as part of the, the modifications that I just talked about um, in the, the position of the bus shelter would reflect any modifications to the adjustment of the uh, of the bus stop position itself. So we'll need to make sure we include that. But thank you for raising that. Definitely. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Councillor O'Brien wants to come back in and I've got Councillor McCann. Thank you, Chair. Oh. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's a couple of points. Um, we've got partly a road, a partly a private driveway, and the difference, as Mr. Bates has just said, is that the four houses won't have a public footpath. So we'll go forward a few years and we've got two or three kids in each of the house so plots five and six i've got six kids and the other four i've got 12 kids between them now then 12 children i've got no footpath and i think this is rather disingenuous to say that four of them would be a private driveway because that's the minimum we can go to or the maximum we can go to before it's got to be a proper road. It's not, it's a shared surface and a shared surface and a thing like that isn't safe. And the gated community, the only way you can get to them houses is come up to a bit of a drive and turn in. It's a gated community. It's nothing to do with security at the back. It's a gated community. Thank you, Chair. Councillor McCann. Thank you, Chair. Um, OK, so looking at this application, um, this this is this application has been made on the on the grounds of an officer has been round uh, on, at, the re, at the request of the Ramblers. Um, and basically the Ramblers are looking to raise funds now. This looks to me like, uh, if I can go to the um, the submission by the Ramblers and also by Councillor Carragher, it says the terms of the agreement were put to the whole council on the 22nd of the 11th, 2018, and that the minutes show that uh, it was approved unanimously. This is about in regard to the, uh, the covenant. Now, I know that the covenant isn't a material consideration, but it is raised here by both uh, in support of uh, the opposite, opposing members um, of the neighbourhood and also the Ramblers. And um, Claire, well, sorry, Councillor Carragher has said that my question will be for the committee. When did the full council rescind this resolution? So I'd like uh, an answer to that, please. When was this actually rescinded? We know. You know when it was. Okay. November 2018. No, I, I, I think I know I could have just heard Councillor Dutton there in the background. Well, I've looked at the minutes of that uh, of that council meeting. I can find no reference to a covenant being rescinded uh, during that meeting at which I was present. Excuse me, Chair. Right. Okay. This was not a council decision. This was made by a cabinet members. This was just a cabinet member decision, if I remember correctly. Okay. I've I just asked people just to remember the protocol and ask people to use the chat facility before they come in. If if you can be mindful of that, that'd be helpful. Uh, what I don't want us to get to, and I'm sure our legal advisor would would 
ask us to do the same is to, and I, I accept Councillor McCann's point, it's being raised by both the objector and the applicant, but I'd like us to stay away from the covenant issue if possible because it's not material planning consideration. Mr Matthews, you wanted to come in. Uh, thank you, Chair. Simply in response to Councillor McCann's query, uh, I think the statement by the response to the petitioner is factually inaccurate. It was actually a Cabinet member decision in November 2018. I think it was a Cabinet member for corporate resources or, and regulatory services. So, in fact, it wasn't a full Council decision. It was a Cabinet member decision. Thank you, Chair. Councillor McCann, you want you want to come back on that? Uh, yes, thanks, Chair. So thanks for that, um, Mr. Williams. So what we're saying is then, so this hasn't got. So it was, and I'm sorry to, to harp on about this, uh, and I know it's not material, but I think it it does have an effect on the whole on the both of the applications. Um, so basically, what we're saying is that. The covenant was voted on uh, by, that was submitted by Councillor Byram and passed by full council, but it was re only rescinded by a cabinet member. And personally, I don't think that is, uh, is, is valid myself. It, it should have gone to full council for consideration. But part that now, because I realise it's not, uh, you know, we know it's not a material consideration, uh, but I do think it's important. Um, what I did pick up here uh, in the Rambler submission is that the application has been put forward now and it says after three years of careful negotiation. So it, it seems to me like this has been being negotiated with the council officers for three years. Have at any time the council officers approached the ward council and the parish council to say that this club is having a problem and that they would really like to try and garner some support because then you wouldn't have been in this situation. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor McCann. Um, I mean, the case office is probably best place to answer that question, but I'm not sure he'd be able to answer that question. I'm not sure even whether that was a rhetorical question, Councillor McCann. Uh, Mr Healy, can you offer anything to enlighten us on that point? or is it? Um, Thank you, Chair. In response to that, um, my job is effectively just to look at the planning application on the basis of how it was assessed. Um, considering it on its merits, we carried out consultation um, in accordance with our statement of community involvement. Um, anything which has led up to the submission of the application involving the estates team or whoever else, um, that's not anything I've been privy to or anything that I'd be you know, expected to be involved with, really. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Mr Healy. Happy for you to come back, Councillor McCann, if you need to. Councillor Friel. Yeah. Um, yes, it, it's just about the, um, the the actual material part of this one. Um, I just have some concern about whether it is, uh, it is for us to have a, a material um, impact on this. If I can explain the reason why, and perhaps I could get some uh, assistance. And I've got my background on now, so, so that, instead of my uh, colourful chair. Um, if I've got the historical element of this right, is full council made some decision which seems to impact on this uh, with Councillor Byron. That was then, because of this uh, application, was given consideration by an executive member of the council for licence and then regulatory. The, the difficulty is, I think, in this and in, in, in where it would normally apply as being a material one is, elected members. Now, I, I, I have to be 
quite honestly, I can't recall back to that motion originally with Council Byron whether I was there or not. But a decision was made by members who would have been on this planning committee that that was what they wished to have applied. Now, it needs legal advice, perhaps, just to just to clarify why this could be a material part of it. And that is that when when the government made changes, it gave executive powers to the cabinet members. So cabinet members do have a right to make a decision. But whether that decision can uh, go over what would be the, um, the the full council's decision isn't something I'm sure of. But what would have happened, Chair, and I think you could maybe give me advice on this uh, to say I'm right or wrong is, when the cabinet, made, cabinet member made a decision, there was a call in period. So elected members would have had an opportunity to say is, I don't agree with this uh, executive decision being implemented. Now, to my knowledge, um, that wasn't called in or questioned. And therefore, the potential is that it legally stands as a decision and something that's part of the council and then becomes no longer a material factor in, in us making this decision. So you can see the two balances that I'm putting forward is one is that the, the governance of the council, which is the, the, the full council, made the decision, changes into local government went into an effect, given executive powers, which gave members the right to say yay or nay. And as nothing was said then is, it becomes the council's position. So if legally that's, I've got my head around that one correctly, the legal advice rather than planning officers advice would be potentially more more appropriate in this case. Have, uh, Chair, have I, have, have I summed that up pretty clearly for you? Yes, you have, Councillor Freel, and, and you, you're right in terms of the calling on the cabinet member position, that, that in the cabinet member decision, that's absolutely correct. All cabinet member decisions are subject to a calling period, uh, unless it's waived under, under the, the constitution. Uh, and I think there's a nuance to the rescinding the covenant because the, its own, the cabinet member agreed, if I'm, if I'm correct, to rescind the covenant subject to the grant of planning permission. So if the planning permission is not granted, the covenant remains in place. The covenant hasn't been lifted until such a time as planning permission is granted, if I'm right on that. So I'll, I've got a string of people waiting to come in, but I will bring in Mr. Kennard, our legal advisor, to maybe clarify a couple of the issues and maybe give us some guidance on how material this is or isn't. Thank you, Chair. So um, there seems to be, if you, hopefully you can hear me now, then there are some issues around whether the Covenant is material and the matter of governance. The matter of governance isn't, I don't consider particularly relevant for, for, purposes, sorry, for purposes of planning committee, um, but that is something I can review. I don't actually have any of the original decisions or the new decision to hand, so I'd have to check on that. As for the tip, can nobody hear me? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to take out. Is that any better? Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, okay, so that's better. In relation to the covenant, the council has got a number of different statutory functions. It is um, a planning authority and it is a private landowner. The original covenant was entered into with the council as a private landowner, albeit through full council decision when they sold the land to the Ramblers. This is a second private landowner's decision to renegotiate or release or relax the terms of the covenant. Again, that's not really for consideration to the committee. I appreciate that there are links and um, that should be considered, but it's actual material is not terribly relevant. It is, that is the function of a, the council as a landowner only. The planning committee should be looking at the 
merits of the application itself and not really focusing on the covenant I'm afraid. Hopefully that's clear. If you want me to look into the issues around the governance, I, I can do that, but I can't do that right now, I'm afraid. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Mr. Kennard. Mr. McKenzie, have you got a comment on this? No? Thank you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I, I concur fully with just being said in terms of what the focus needs to be for, the, for this decision making, the sort of whys and wherefores about uh, our internal processes as to whether covenant's been released or not, uh, is as you say, Chair, uh, in any event subject to the grant of planning permission, but whether or not uh, the applicant has the legal right to implement that permission is a completely separate issue. We need to focus on the planning merits of Mr Kennard's first. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Mr. McKenzie. Councillor Friel, you want to come back in? Turn on now, Councillor Friel. Yeah. Yes, I just uh, clicked the button and it mu oh, muted it again. Sorry about that. Uh, I find it difficult to follow the argument that's being put forward by the officers chair. My understanding of, of, of planning committee rules and where legislation stands is where members of the planning committee have made a decision or you would call it predetermination when it comes to an actual planning meeting. Members who are voting at that time on Councillor Byram's motion made now a predetermination. I don't think the legal point of this has been understood. Now, what I was saying before, what I was asking it was clearly understood was that since then, we've had a change in the way things are done. We agree on executive members of the Cabinet making a decision and the right to call it in or not call it in. So. That's why I, I, I don't see that uh, you can say it's not relevant on a matter for planning consideration because it's a predetermination quite clearly. And, you know, maybe I should get a, a job in the law you know, because it just seems that it's pretty common sense and obvious. Everyone says, here's what we want publicly, that's known. And then we, we, we couldn't say that would be a predetermination. So. I think there's been a change in the way things have been done since Councillor Byram's motion. And now we should be moving on to making a determination on this application as it stands without the covenant being an issue for it. But it's still a, it, 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 it's still a, a very important point for this committee that if you've made decisions in full council, then that does impact on on planning meetings. You could take the um, the monitoriums that we've had in the past on other issues. You could not say that does not affect into a planning committee decision. So I hope my point's taken in good faith. That that's the viewpoint that I have. Okay. Thank you for that, Councillor Free. I think that's you've, you've made your point loud and clear. Thank you. I'm just checking. Councillor Michael O'Brien. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, as I understand it, until plan permission is given, is in place. There is still a council interest in this land. And we have a moratorium for council involvement on land that there be no gated communities. This is a gated community. That, along with the shared surfaces, the um, access onto Moor Lane, chair, 
I'd like to move refusal of the application. Chair, seconded. Okay, that's moved and seconded. Councillor O'Brien, I may well come back to you looking at uh, our legal advisor for clarity on exactly what we're, we're, we're moving in terms of a recommendation of refusal. Uh, and that was seconded by Councillor Kelly, was it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, Councillor McCann. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to follow up on uh, what Councillor O'Brien said, I'd like to support him in that. I was going to move refusal on the grounds that um, the current land is uh, part of a sports facility um, which needs to be maintained within the borough. So uh, I disagree that, um, you know, irrespective of the covenant, the sports facility, there's enough opposition uh, from this. 92 um, people have opposed it. Um, and I think I just want to support what uh, Councillor O'Brien said, oppose it on the grounds that uh, this land is actually part of a sports facility. Thank you, Chair. Hey, Mr. Healy, do you want to come back and say anything on the the, the grounds for the proposed refusal? Thank you, Chair. In terms of the the um, reasons for refusal, which have been um, tabled, I think there's a number of elements. In terms of the um, gated access moratorium, that's not a planning consideration. Um, the presence of a, a gate could be um, kind of resisted on design grounds, I suppose. Um, in terms of the land being allocated as open space and an existing sports use, um, all I can say is I've obviously assessed it um, on the basis of a replacement car park being being proposed. Ultimately, if that isn't secured, which is the upcoming item, and um, they wouldn't be able to implement the scheme, this current scheme anyway. Um, but I can't see a justifiable reason to refuse it on that basis, in, in, in my opinion. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Mr Healy. Is there anything else from members? No. Mr Mackenzie, do you, do you want to come in before we do the vote? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I appreciate there's a, a motion to refuse the application. Uh, but as the case officers rightly highlighted, we, we have some issues around attaching reasons for refusal that that would hopefully withstand an, an appeal. Uh, we fully understand where uh, some members are coming from on this. And I think probably a, a better course of action I could recommend would be to <coughs> defer the application for us to give further thought to that and then to bring it back on that basis. OK, thank you for that, Mr Mackenzie. Councillor Dutton. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, following on from uh, Mr Mackenzie's um, um, putting forward the deferment, if we were going to put forward def uh, to defer, would it be possible to have a police report carried out on this? As as sort of peppered through this, this report appears to be uh, mention of antisocial behaviour, but we don't appear to have a police report. Would that be possible, please? I'm sure case officers hear what you're saying and, and may have already done, but could request input from the, uh, is it still the police architectural liaison officer? I'm, I'm not sure. Anyway, I'm sure, point made, Councillor Dutton. Mr. Thank you. I, I just asked before I bring Mr. Kennard in. I just asked the 
moving and seconded at the motion to refuse just to consider Mr McKenzie's comments and then maybe I'll bring you back in after we prepare for Mr Kennard. Mr Kennard, can you put on your camera please? But I would just like to echo all you what Derek has said and that um, to make sure that council is aware that if we do ultimately move to refuse without valid defensible planning grounds, there will be risks of appeal and costs, which I would like to try and protect the council from. So that's all I'd like to add at this stage. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I've got Councillor Freel, Councillor O'Brien, and then Councillor McCann. I'd like to uh, put forward the idea that we uh, defer this to just straighten out some of the uh, the points that have been raised because I think that's uh, that that would be a fair method of making an appraisal. That I'm happy to move it, or for anyone else that's move someone previously to move that chair i think that's uh, an admirable suggestion to uh, to to really see where we can come up to and allay any fears or, or or substantiate them so i think that's uh, that i think that's the way forward i'm sure i Thanks, Chair. Um, in light of the advice we've just been given by the Head of Planning and the Legal Department, um, can I withdraw the motion to refuse and in place put in um, a motion to defer? I would second that, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor McCann, then Councillor Dutton. Thank you, Chair. I, I just want to say that this is precisely, the situation that we find ourselves in now is precisely what I was talking about, that the covenant should not have been withdrawn prior to planning permission. It should have been that the planning permission would have been accept, uh, given in the first instance on the understanding that then they would look at the covenant. And I think this is why we're in this mess now. So um, I, I don't think it's been done very well. Thank you, Chair. And Councillor Dutton. Hi, thanks, Chair. Yes, I was actually going to cancel my request to speak because I was going to second uh, the deferment. Thank you. Happy to, happy, happy to second it. Okay, so the, there seems to be a consensus built now that we're happy to defer. So I'll just check with committee, are we happy to defer this item? Yes, Chair. Chair, yes. Can, I, can I just come back with a, a quick comment? Your luck, Councillor O'Brien. I, I, I thank, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I don't have a problem with it, but I think what we've, we've got to sort out between ourselves, and I get the impression that the covenant hasn't been lifted until it gets planning permission. So at the present moment, the covenant is still in place. Is that right? Not that it makes any difference, because it's not material to the decision. <laughs> Councillor O'Brien, I'm sorry I missed all of that. I, 
Sorry about that, Chair. I don't know if it was your fault or my fault, but whichever. Um, Councillor McCann was saying about the covenant shouldn't have been lifted. As I understand it, the covenant hasn't been lifted until we give plan permission. And if that's the case, the covenant, although it's not material to this decision, the covenant is still in place. Okay, Mr. Matthews. <clears throat> Thank you, <clears throat> Chair. Just a couple of comments uh, to make. <clears throat> really picking up with the the about the covenant, uh, the that arrangement um, is dependent on planning permission granted. So it's conditional on planning permission. That is entirely a normal uh, way of doing this kind of thing, where. Uh, you would get the planning permission first before the uh, terms of the uh, covenant and the release of the covenant would be finalised. Um, just another couple of comments, if I may. Um, the issue of the sports facilities um, has been uh, fully addressed within the report. And in fact, we discussed uh, with Sport England because they uh, had asked a question about uh, whether they should have been consulted. And when we spoke to them and said how we'd addressed it, they were uh, absolutely satisfied uh, by that. So we, uh, the applicant has given a justification for the loss of the tennis courts for which there is no uh, need in the area. So that actually has been uh, comprehensively covered in the report. I think the issue of antisocial behaviour is one which led to the initial discussions between uh, the Ramblers FC representatives and officers of the council back in 2018. And that led to the decision that was taken by the cabinet member. I don't think anybody is necessarily saying that there is a continuing issue with antisocial behaviour. But also just to pick up a point which has been made in discussion uh, about the fact that the council took this decision back in 1987 or whenever it was, uh, and it's a cabinet member now, yes, the way the council does business has changed um, and it's very clear on the cabinet member, it's actually the cabinet member for regulatory compliance and corporate services and it's quite clear on that that this is not a key decision and as members will appreciate that it's only key decisions that would come to cabinet and sometimes then to council for their decision. So the way the uh, decision has been made has been entirely appropriate in line with current procedures. I hope that helps clarify a couple of matters. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you for that, Mr Matthews. It does help clarify. I think we've already indicated and there was no dissent of the deferment, so I stated the items deferred. Which brings us to item 5A on the agenda, which again relates to the program bus. Can I, I'll, before we move on, I'll just, I'll just check uh, with our legal advisor whether he's happy to accept that deferment or whether we need to move to a formal vote. I don't think there was any dissent to the deferment, so I think that's, that's okay. Yeah, just checking, yeah, and that's a, that's agreed from our legal advisor. So we'll move on, item 5A, relates to the Liverpool Ramblers, Morlane and Crosby. And again, Mr Healy, could you introduce the report, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, for ease of reference, the plans and photographs for this application can be found at 7B of the agenda, which is pages 161 to 164. The committee report is at page 25. This proposal is for the layout of a car park on part of land previously occupied by Moor Park Lawn Tennis Club to the rear of the Liverpool Ramblers grounds. The application has been submitted as a direct result of the policy implications of item 4A, i.e. replacement car park facilities are required in order to justify the loss of the existing car park. The application 
and has been called in by Councillor Carragher and is subject to objections from five individual addresses, including one received yesterday. The main issue, again, to consider is the principle of development in regards to protection of open space. The site was last utilised over a decade ago as tennis courts. Since then, the site has been entirely subsumed by self-seeding trees. The applicant has submitted a detailed justification statement which confirms there is no unmet demand for tennis courts in the Crosby area, and thus the site is surplus to requirements. Further consideration has also been given to the potential, potential provision of alternative sporting uses. However, the site is not deemed to be suitable in terms of size or location. This is before deliver, deliverability is even considered. Overall, the proposal is deemed acceptable in principle. In regard to access and highway safety, the car park would provide a one-for-one -one replacement of existing facilities. Therefore, it is not envisaged that there will be a significant increase in usage. It is, however, considered necessary to ensure existing facilities are closed prior to the new car park coming into use, which can be secured within Section 106 legal agreement. The applicant has agreed to landscape the remainder of the former tennis courts, which is overgrown and understood to have attracted antisocial behaviour in the past. Details of this, including replacement tree planting, can be secured within a condition. <coughs> Taking all matters into account, the proposal is considered acceptable, subject to the completion of a Section 106 legal agreement and the conditions set out on page 34 of the agenda, the proposal is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> okay, thank you, Mr Healy. An objection to this application has been received from the Ward Councillor, Councillor Claire Carragher, who submitted a written representation as detailed on pages 11 and 12 of the Supplementary Agenda Pack. And Mr Matthews, you're going to read out the representation for us. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Just to be clear, this is exactly the same representation as I previously read out, but it was presented by Councillor Carragher jointly to uh, items 4A and 5A. So in order for it to be considered as part of this item, I'll read it again. I am writing in support of the local residents of Thornton and their objection to the building of houses and a car park on the land of Ramblers Football Club. Firstly, I would like to bring to the attention of the Planning Committee to a restrictive covenant on the said land of the Ramblers imposed by Sefton MBC that the property should not be used for any purpose other than a football recreation ground or as a ground for athletics or for the playing of such other games as may be permitted by Sefton, whose consent should be evidenced in writing. This covenant was the subject of planning permission back in July 1994, when Sainsbury's PLC showed an interest in the land. This was the subject of a resolution by Councillor Les Byram mm. at full council on the 31st of May 1994, understanding order number 25, and full council resolved that the council would not be minded to change the existing preemption clause or the restrictive covenant at this time to permit any development. My question to the committee would be, when did full council rescind this resolution, discharging or modifying the restrictive covenant contained on the transfer of the 18th of June 1987, which states that the transferees shall not within 80 years from the date hereof sell or otherwise dispose of the land. May I refer the committee to the case of Hopcroft, 1993, reference 66pcc.r.475. In relation to the more local issues as stated by residents, this development would increase traffic to the local area which suffers from severe congestion, hence the Thornton Corridor study. This is an area which suffers detrimentally from heavy traffic and in the last few years, local councillors have had to make significant changes to the area to allow traffic to flow more easily, closing a cut through road, Edgemoor Drive, which is directly opposite the development and making modifications to the Thornton Crescent. This development will create increased traffic congestion and pollution to the area that is already at threat of high levels of pollution and to irradiate a further green space in the area 
will not help to reduce carbon emissions, thus contradicting Sefton Council's clean green agenda. Public spaces, given that we are hopefully at the end of a global pandemic, the limited green space that the borough of Sefton has, has proven to be a lifesaver to most of our community. Thornton has a number of residents who live in flats and have no access to a garden. During this trying time, local people have newly discovered their area and have taken to parks and green spaces, the Rambler site being one of them. We are very lucky to have these hidden gems in our area and to take a further site away for unaffordable housing in a gated community would be detrimental to our residents' mental and physical health. We need to preserve our sanity and health going forward if we are to survive this pandemic. Finally, this development is earmarked to be a gated community. This is again not what Thornton is about. This development sets out to isolate itself from the rest of the community. This is not in keeping with the local area aesthetics or the idealisation of the people who live within this community. This is an open community with open spaces. Thank you, Chair. Much shown as life. I'm, I assume I am live, but I'm not shown as life. Uh, okay, a response yet, to the board. Uh, it's just lagging a bit. The connection's lagging a bit. You're live now, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Okay, response to the ward council submission has been received from the applicant Liverpool Ramblers AFC, as detailed in pages 13 to 14 of the supplementary agenda pack. And I'll ask Mr. Kennard if he can read out the submission for us. Uh, thank you, Chair. Hopefully you can hear me this time. Whilst this debate is as much as possible a focused response to the statements referred to in the header above, it must be emphasised that all points made are inherently interrelated with planning application reference DC 2019 02088. The interrelated nature of both applications has been considered as critical throughout the application process to ensure that both applications can be assessed under current planning policy. We have worked closely with the case officer throughout the application process to ensure that all planning policy is strictly complied with. The background. Historically, the genesis of this planning application is the result of an on-site inspection by an officer from Sefton Council who met two of our members at our request in relation to our concerns over the poor condition of the long disused tennis courts. The overgrown state of the tennis courts and vandalism of the tennis pavilion were pointed out. It was clear that antisocial behaviour was rife on the site, there had been fires set in the old pavilion and there was drug equipment lying around. The officer made it clear the council did not have the funds to carry out any remedial work or in fact make the site safe. During this meeting a solution was discussed and even encouraged that the Ramblers purchase the site and use it as a car park to be financed by building on our existing car park. We were aware of the restrictive covenant but there was enough common ground to pursue the objective leading to the application which we now present after three years of careful negotiation. The terms of the agreement were put before the whole council on the 22nd of 11th, 2018, and the minutes of this meeting show that it was approved unanimously subject to planning consent. Environment. The proposal seeks to relocate an existing car park owned and used by the Ramblers to a site which has fallen into severe disrepair and as such currently represents a health hazard due to the presence of vermin, as well as attracting numerous instances of antisocial behaviour. These issues currently affect the entire neighbourhood and as such, implementation of our proposals can be understood as a positive contribution to all land users in the locality, as we will be accepting responsibility for the general maintenance of the whole former tennis club site, as well as our existing land. Traffic. The relocation of the existing car park is proposed on a like-for-like -like basis, with the capacity remaining the same. 
Our activities as a club will remain unchanged and therefore it is not anticipated that there will be any increase in vehicular movements as a result of this application and as such any perceived safety risk will remain unchanged in terms of numbers. Operationally, the proposal represents an improvement in safety for all users as parking spaces within the new layout will be marked out according to current space sizing standards and designed passing places will be introduced along the access drive. As a result of the implementation of the concurrent housing scheme to the front of our land, the existing turn off Moor Lane will be modified with improved visibility and surfacing. In conclusion, as a club, we understand our responsibility to contribute positively to the neighbourhood of which we are part. As such, we feel that our proposals represent the best opportunity to solve obvious existing problems of environmental health and antisocial behaviour associated with the existing state of the location, as well as ensure the Ramblers can continue as a club for generations to come and thereby continue to contribute to the ongoing sustainability of the neighbourhood. In conclusion, we ask the committee to approve our two applications in the knowledge that implementation will solve many significant existing problems in this location. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. The recommendations there. Is there any comments from members? Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Um, just a quick quote from the very first paragraph of the submission from the applicants. The interrelated nature of both applications has been considered as critical. So, if they're both interrelated, therefore, Chair, can I move the deferral along with the other one? Thank you. Can I second that, Chair? Okay, I think a deferment to be moved and seconded. Moved by Councillor O'Brien, seconded by Councillor Kelly. Uh, I'm not seeing. I am seeing Bob McCann. Councillor McCann, would you like to come in? Thank you, Chair. Um, just to confirm then that this, I agree uh, with the deferral. But what I would like to see, if it does get deferred, I would like to see that the ward councillors, the local uh, parish council and Sport England be consulted in what other uses this land can be put to. Because you're just having half of it as a car or a proposed car park and the rest of it is just going to be landscaped, which is sport, it is sports facility land. For me, that, if it's not used as tennis courts, it could be used for something else, even a bowling green. And I think there needs to be investigations uh, made in terms of fundraising um, and any grant funding that's available, which there is grant funding available if, if they know where to look, if they're pointed in the right direction. So I support the deferral. Thanks, Chair. Thank you for that, Councillor McCann. I'm sure that then points are noted by the officers. Okay, I don't see any dissent from the deferment. So in line with Councillor O'Brien's words, that item is deferred. Okay, we're going to adjourn for a short break. So can I ask everyone to be back online, ready to go in 15 minutes time? Thank you.
Your mic's still muted, Chair. Sean is on muted. Is it muted now? Oh, You're fine now, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. Welcome back. Uh, Mr Hanson, can we just do a quick roll call just to make sure all members are back? Certainly. Apologies, I'm just finding my list. Okay. Right, time for a roll call. Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Blackburn? Here. Councillor Dodd? Present. Councillor Dutton? Present. Councillor Friel? Here. Councillor Kelly? Present. Councillor McCann? Present. Councillor Brenda O'Brien? Present. Councillor Michael O'Brien? Present. Councillor Pullin? Present. Councillor Roach? Present. Councillor Anne Thompson. Present. Councillor Lynn Thompson. Present. Councillor Tweed. Councillor Tweed, can you turn on your mic and just come present? Present. Thank you. Councillor Waterfield. Present. Councillor Beedon. Present. Okay, now the officers. Chief Planning Officer David McKenzie. Present. Legal advisor Neil Kennard. Present. Planning manager Steve Matthews. Present. Transport and Transport Planning and Highway Development Officer Stephen Birch. Present. Senior Engineer Flood and Coastal Risk Management Sam Dimber. Present. Principal Environmental Health Officer Greg Martin. Present. Team Leader, Development Management, Kevin Baker. Present. Thank you. Senior Planning Officer, Stephen Healy. Present. Senior Planning Officer, Diane Humphreys. Present. Senior Planning Officer, Neil Mackey. Present. That concludes the roll call, Chair. Thank you for that, Mr Hanson. OK, so... We're up to item 5B on the agenda. This relates to land east of Villas Road in McGull. And I'll ask Mr Healy to present this item for us. Thank you, Chair. Um, for ease of reference, the plans and photographs for this application can be found at 7C of the agenda, which is pages 165 to 170. The report begins at page 37. The proposal seeks outline permission for the erection of a low secure mental health inpatient facility. The applicants Merseycare are applying for access to be agreed up front with matters including appearance, landscaping, layout and scale to be agreed at reserve matters stage. The proposal is made to development which raises an issue of principle and therefore must be de determined by planning committee. Planning decisions are required to be made in accordance with the adopted development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. In saying this, the main issue to consider is the principle of developing safeguarded land within the current development plan period <clears throat> and whether material considerations outweigh any policy com conflicts. Safeguarded land is defined within the local plan as land between the existing urban area and inner boundary of the green belt. This may be required to meet long-term development needs beyond 2030. Policy MNA states that the development safeguarded land is not permitted unless for temporary purposes or where necessary for the operation of existing uses. The committee report clarifies that neither apply in this situation and therefore de development is unacceptable in principle. In shifting focus to the specifics of the development and the benefits it presents, the Law Secure Unit would accommodate up to 40 patients and provide care for individuals with learning difficulties largely, largely convicted of an offence and on a managed basis before they are able to safely return into the community. The facility would replace an existing Law Secure Unit in East Lancashire 
which has been criticised by the NHS for its model of care. The proposed state-of-the-art facility at Magul would be co-located alongside existing high and medium secure facilities, as such allowing unique opportunity to share expertise and resources um, amongst a three-tiered level of mental health care and the best possible standard of care for these vulnerable persons. In order to justify the loss of safeguarded land, the applicant was asked to demonstrate why there is nowhere else within their or the NHS's portfolio where the low secure unit could be provided in accordance with their outlined clinical model. Sites in Greater Manchester and Cheshire have been ruled out, as has land at McGull Health Park, including the former HMP Kennet, um, due to cost and timescale implications. Funding for the facility has been agreed at central government level and the applicant has asserted that there is no available source of funding which would allow the development of Kennet. In summary, if permission were to be refused, there would be a genuine risk of the facility not being delivered and the associated harm caused to mental health care in North West England. Improving healthcare for some of the region's most vulnerable persons is a significant benefit which weighs in favour of this application, while economic benefits are also evident through job creation. In order, in order to apply due weight to these benefits, the harm caused needs to be quantified also. In general, significant weight ought to be applied to maintaining the integrity of safeguarded land. However, in this instance, the application site only comprises around 5% of Sefton's safeguarded land. There will be no precedent set given the unique nature of the proposal, and the remainder of the allocation could still come forward without prejudice. Given Sefton can demonstrate a five-year supply of housing, there would be no need to bring forward a review of the local plan due to the loss of this modest parcel of land. In terms of other considerations, a detailed transport assessment has been provided to the satisfaction of the highways manager, while Merseyside Environmental Advisory Service are satisfied that lost priority habitats can be appropriately mitigated. All other technical matters have been resolved or can be adequately addressed at reserved matters stage or pursuant to the conditions set out on page 52 of the agenda. Overall, there is a fine planning balance, however, it is considered that significant social benefits and substantial economic benefits presented um, outweigh the limited harm caused by virtue of releasing safeguarded land within the current plan period. The, pro the proposal does not comply with the Sefton local plan in its entirety, however, other material considerations indicate that permission ought to be forthcoming. The application is therefore recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Mr Healy. Over to members. Uh, Councillor O'Brien, you've indicated. Thanks, Chair. Um, Mr Healy's just, I wouldn't say it's passing, but it was mentioned about an increase in employment. How much of an increase in employment is there going to be in the area? And more importantly, where is the employment going to come from? Mr Healy, can you turn your mic on, please? Apologies. Um, through you, Chair, in terms of the employment which would be generated, um, the facility would have the exact same number of posts as the site in East Lancashire, which is due to be closed, um, which I believe is 173. Um, I'm just going to grab up the committee report now. Um, they have ca 178, apologies. The applicant has carried out a survey of existing staff members um, to scope whether or not they'd be likely to relocate to, to Magull. Um, apparently only 15 have indicated that they would want to move to the low secure unit in Magull um, and therefore they'd, they'd be seeking alternative employment. So there's indications that there would still be about 160 jobs created. Um, 
um, by the new facility in McGull. Um, and then you'd obviously have the associated supply chain and whatnot, not to mention the, the construction phase as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Councillor McCann. Thank you, Chair. I didn't know I'd indicated, but uh, I was going to uh, anyway. Um, Psychic, you say. <laughs> um, Mr Healy mentioned social benefits. Um, I'm just wondering what the social benefits uh, of, of a mental health unit could possibly be, but uh, other than uh, obviously from a, a medical point of view. But I'm interested in the... Um, in the report that's here saying that they've ruled out um, utilising HMP Kennet, the former prison, um, and it says it's due to timescales and costing submitted. So basically what they're saying is they'd rather build on greenfield sites. Obviously it's not in the green belt anymore. They'd rather build on a greenfield site than um, on a brownfield site, which, is, uh, which they own and which they, is right next to their facility. But what I'm really interested in, um, the applicants claim works costs will be £4.6 million pounds higher uh, for redeveloping Kennet than the current application site, although the council's consultant can test this and can be reduced to a £3.7 million pound difference, which the, which the applicant has not challenged. Are we saying then that the applicant has over it when they've assessed their costs in uh, in dealing with um, HMP Canet. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, those, um, the cost variation is based solely on the um, build costs and not the overall kind of cost which would um, be incurred throughout the project timeline. Um, so the difference there would be even greater. But yes, we did have those um, figures corroborated by um, a pro, should I say, sorry, by our um, viability consultants, and they did comment that the the difference will be less than than what Merseycare stated. Um, in terms of their preference for this site over Kenneth, obviously cost implications and time scale implications are a consideration. Um, they've also stated that they didn't wish to develop Kenneth. There's no support from NHS England due to it being on a former prison site and the perception and implications that present so that's another reason for favouring the application site over Kenna. Thank you Chair. Councillor McCann, come back if you, if you, if you want yeah. to, you look like you wanted to. Yeah, sorry, Chair. I was just waiting for the um, for the for the uh, red light there. Um, so I am concerned that this is safeguarded land. It shouldn't be developed. It's for the duration to, it's to provide um, uh, land for the duration of the local plan. It is also, uh, I think we've seen it classified as Grade One agricultural land. Can it, can you confirm, Mr. Healy, is this uh, land currently being farmed? Through you, Chair. Um, to my knowledge, I do not know when it was last farmed for agricultural purposes. Um, by virtue of it being allocated um, a safeguarded land through the local plan process, that was um, given consideration as as was previous green belt sites, which had been allocated for housing as well. So um, at, at this point, the fact that it is safeguarded land um, addresses that issue, if you will. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I've got Councillor O'Brien. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a couple of quick ones. Mr Healy said there's 160-odd jobs up in um, 
Wally or whatever it is, and only 15 of them want to come down to um, Sefton. So that leaves us about 150 jobs. Can we condition the application that a substantial amount of the new jobs go to people from Sefton? And can I say, and it's, um, I've I, I got to be careful which words you use here. Can we make sure that they're, they're not, not just the menial jobs? That normally happens with um, so-called degeneration in Sefton. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I'll I'll bring in Mr. Healy. I don't know whether he's ready to come in on that point, but I'll bring bring him in. You're ready to come in. Okay, Mr. Healy, do you want to answer that then? Um. Through you, Chair, um, we have utilised conditions in the past, if it's considered reasonable and necessary, um, to secure a certain level of employment. Um, in this instance, we could very well attach a condition requiring the submission of an employment charter, um, which would be reviewed alongside our colleagues in Sefton at work. I'd say it's probably unreasonable to put a specific um, number on the um, the post you'd want to be advertised and made available in Sefton because um, first and foremost even though only 15 people have indicated they wish to stay at Coldstones in, in Lancashire that number might be different in the future and they'd obviously have first refusal in terms of the their equivalent post at, um, at McGull. So, I mean, in terms of condition wording, um, I'd, I'd suggest something um, fairly generic in terms of prior to commencement of development, um, an employment charter should be submitted and agreed in writing by the local planning authority. Um, and as I said, that would be looked at in with the help of our colleagues in Sefton at work. Thank you. Sorry, Chair, I can't get, uh, you know, type in that I want to speak, if that's OK. Uh, Councillor Kelly. Yeah. Councillor Kelly. Right, Mr. Healy, uh, the job states there now, you, you said probably 150 jobs will come to Sefton. Sorry, you, have you, sorry. is your camera on? No, sorry, sorry, I apologise. Um, 150 jobs will come to Sefton. But you've just stated there now that um, 15 have, ref you know, have only indicated they're going to come. So potentially the rest of them could indicate they're going to transfer. So we won't get any jobs at all. Am I right? Through you, Chair. Um, it's still an ongoing process, um, the closure of cold stones. Um, we can only act on the basis of what we're advised. I'd be surprised if there, if there was a significantly higher people who um, percentage of people who decided to change their mind um, and, and relocate to McGull. Um, on the basis of what's been submitted, they're saying 163 posts will be advertised um, at McGull. Um, uh, but it's 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 uncertain as to, as to the true number. Um, so truthfully, to be honest, yeah. we could potentially get no jobs at all. Truthfully, yeah. am I correct? Do you want to say that again? Sorry. Potentially, we will not. <laughs> apologies, if, apologies. Um, this, 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 we get no jobs whatsoever. There's a possibility, there's a reasonable possibility that the, the number of jobs created in Sefton could be a lot different. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. I've got Councillor Roach indicating, but before I bring Councillor Roach in, Mr Matthews, did you want to come in on the employment issue? <coughs> Mr Matthews. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to be clear on this, I think the position is that at the moment, about 15 of the something like 178 
current post holders have said that they uh, would uh, wish to move to McGill. So the, the balance of that, over 160, currently have said that they uh, that they would they wouldn't move, and therefore we expect that there would be around 160 jobs available in the local area. What Mr. He is saying is we can't absolutely guarantee that number because obviously other people may choose uh, to move who are currently employed in Lancashire but I think overall we would expect that there would be um, the majority and possibly the vast majority of the jobs uh, could be available for local residents uh, but as Mr Healy was saying, it's impossible to say that just at the moment. But the expectation is it would be the vast majority of jobs would be available locally when they transfer. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you for that, Mr Matthews. Councillor Roach. Uh, it's OK, I was looking at the wrong spot. Okay. OK, the map's not orientated properly. It's The map is like going west to west to east rather than north to south. OK. So it's got an indicator of north, but it's not. It's the wrong way around, that's what I was looking for. OK, thank you. OK, Councillor Rhodes, thank you for that. Councillor McCann. Thank you, Chair. Um, right, reading through the report, uh, it's riddled uh, with reasons why this should not go ahead, why this should not be approved. And I've just had a quote here, planning services have throughout the assessment of the application sought to clarify the feasibility and prospect of the low secure unit being located elsewhere within the McGull Health Park. So planning, I think planning have, have sort of been asking for alternatives for this and basically, basically Healthcare, uh, Mersey Healthcare, haven't uh, haven't picked us up on it. I want to. Uh, I, I can't see that there are going to be any social benefits. Um, I don't think you can guarantee the jobs um, for uh, that there will be significant jobs because people can travel. It's on a good um, uh, a good transport route. People can travel uh, to these places, and it, it is quite specialised as well. Um, it is greenfield, and I think that we should be encouraging brownfield first. When the local plan was um, put forward and it was accepted, it was accepted on the basis, it was promoted on the basis that without a local plan, developers can build where they want and that we want to protect green sites. Well, I think this is a sign when we need to be protecting green sites. You've got a brownfield site there, which is HMP Kennet, uh, which they should be looking at and not just leaving it to go um, to go undeveloped. Uh, I want to propose that uh, refusal on this one. Thank you. OK, that's, that's noted, Councillor McCann. Sorry, Mr. McKenzie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to come back to Councillor McCann's uh, points there. Uh, the report does highlight the positives and negatives aspect of it. So there'll be parts of the report that clearly uh, show uh, areas of concern that the case officers identified. Mr. McKenzie, your microphone's on mute. Sorry about that. Apologies, Chair. Through you. Uh, just to address the points raised by Councillor McCann, the report is uh, very detailed and it does highlight all the positive and negative aspects of the application. And that's to show that it's being thorough in trying to arrive at the proper planning balance. Uh, the issue about the policy and non compliance with that uh, has been sort of set out in, in, in great detail. And we've always made the point that we operate in a plan-led system and that uh, we need to consider everything that's in accordance with the development plan. But statute and government advice is telling us that this is really the starting point where development must be in accordance with the development plan, unless other material considerations indicate otherwise. 
Uh, so we can't just write it off because it's contrary to the, to the plan. We have to effectively look at all the be benefits that might accrue as a result of the proposal and then reach the planning balance through that. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are high court cases that, that reinforce that point. And just in the case when we don't have a development plan, <laughs> we're a hostage to fortune. But that doesn't mean to say because we have that we can just uh, turn these schemes away without being properly looked at and, and weighed up. Uh, in terms of the social uh, benefits, clearly it's going to be uh, an important facility for people with mental health and there'll be people in Sefton that will uh, have the benefit of that facility and hopefully be properly integrated back into the community. Uh, so, uh, and also I pick up the point as well about the employment and in, in a matter of fact, they can't be guaranteed, but what we can do is work through that relationship uh, with the health authority uh, and come to an understanding that they will prioritise those jobs in Sefton. And uh, it, it, the suggested approach of putting a condition that uh, you know reasonable or best endeavours uh, is an acceptable way of, of doing that. So the report does weigh up the conflict with the local plan, I feel, in terms of the social and economic benefits, which is how uh, it's arrived at a recommendation for approval. I hope that clarifies things. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Henry. Got Councillor O'Brien and Councillor Dutton. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, taking into consideration what Mr. McKenzie just said about we'd have to work on a condition for employment, can I move that a suitably where the condition is it added? to uh, the conditions that are there that a substantial amount of the extra jobs come to the residents of Sefton and with that in mind can I move approval? Can I second that then please? Councillor Kelly can I second that then please? Yeah, that's, that's noted. That's been moved and seconded. That's noted. Councillor Dutton. Hi, yes. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I really just wanted to support uh, Councillor McCann and second his motion uh, to refuse it, uh, as I don't actually see any special circumstances to be developing on the uh, on this green belt. Thank you. OK, again, noted. Councillor Dutton. Is there anything further on this? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, can I just clarify then, got the motion of refusal by Councillor McCann. What actually are the grounds of refusal? Thank you. Uh, sorry, Chair, I was just uh, distracted there. Uh, yeah, it will be. I mean, there are so many things in the um, in the report. I would have to come up, but uh, basically, I think it would be that. Um, uh, it doesn't, is it uh, policy MN 8.2? It doesn't meet the um, the conditions of MN 8.2. I would have to basically uh, come through and, and uh, I would ask officers for um, the precise, um, precise reason. But I mean, the reasons are given within the report. Um, and obviously, coming into the meeting with an open mind. Um, I haven't got anything uh, prepared, but uh, it seems to me that it is, there are sufficient grounds. And as uh, Councillor Dutton has just said, the, looking at it in, in terms of weight, there isn't sufficient weight to, uh, to release that land when there is Brownfield uh, site right next door to it. Thank you. 
Uh, do you need to bear the clarity on that, or you? you... Oh. Okay, I think the advice is we need to be a bit more specific. If we're going to put a vote to the committee, we need to know exactly what we're voting on. So I, what I'll do is I'll ask officers to pick up the points you raised earlier, Councillor McCann, and maybe come up with some policy areas so we can be a bit more precise about, about what's actually being put to committee. Uh, so just want to reiterate the particular points, Councillor McCann. I know you mentioned you didn't think the economic benefit. She didn't think there was a social benefit in, uh, in relation to the release of the, the or build on the green fields. But they remain three issues. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the, um, we, there are no jobs that can be guaranteed is um, it is one of the of the reasons, but it's not the actual specific um, point in the uh, in the local plan. Um, when we were told about the local plan, we were told that it was going to um, protect the greenfield sites. The greenfield site is safeguarded on the for future development. Um, it's not, you would have to release the, the, the safeguarded land, you would have to release it uh, for development. It's prime agricultural land and that there is a brownfield site right next door to it. The only thing it, which understandably they don't want to spend the money in, uh, in having to clear that land. But that isn't sufficient weight just to say that they can release it and and put it you know build on green on a, a green field site so that's the those are the reasons why um as for the specific parts of the local plan like i say um i did come across uh, policy m8.2 um but i would have to uh, refer to officers to come up with reasons because throughout the report there are, you know, a, a number of reasons. Um, it, in fact, it's so, uh, it, it's a tenuous, um, a, a tenuous report. I appreciate what Mr. McKenzie has said about that it's been looked into very carefully, but, um, you know, it, it, the, the weight of the decision isn't there for me. For me. Okay. Thanks for that. I'm, I'm not sure that moves Mr. Carr's on any in in determining exactly what we're going to put to committee. Uh, maybe I'll bring Mr. Carr back in just to to clarify exactly what he needs. Thank you, Chair. Um, I I. I, it's not my place to, to speak in three words, so I'm, I'm afraid, but I, I need, if you want a motion to refusal, that, that is fine, that is uh, your role, but I, I need some like substantial grounds. Maybe the chair would agree to um, essentially put the meeting on hold while we discuss with officers or something, but we need a, if you want to remove a refusal, can we get some set wording about where the policies are that you object to? And the grounds that we're going to refuse on, or potentially refuse on, if that's at all possible. Um, at the moment, it's I think I consider that too vague to put before a vote. Thank you, Chair. Okay. I'm not adverse to, to taking a short recess, uh, five minute recess to uh, Before we do though, I'm going to bring in Councillor Pullum. Uh, yes, yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you for bringing me in just before the, the possible recess. On page, on page 51, uh, the bottom of the third paragraph, it, it, it states there are unique circumstances and measurable benefits at present which justify departure from the development plan. 
I think the issue here, I'm not seeing within this this document unique circumstances that does justify a depart departure for it to build this facility to be built on grade A agricultural land. I can see benefits of the facility and that bring to the population and the people who use the services, but I fail to see the I fail to be won over at the moment with the argument and uniqueness, I don't think it's really that transparent. Okay, points point made, Councillor Pullen. I, well, I think we've reached a little bit of a, a, a juncture here, a little bit of an impasse, because we're not going to be able to move forward to vote on a, a, a motion to refuse unless we're clear about what we're voting on. And we're not going to get to the point where we're going to be clear unless we do recess I think and give Councillor McCann a chance to speak to officers so uh, what I propose is we do recess just for five minutes it's 20 past three now we come back in at 25 past three and then hopefully we can move forward so Olaf can you uh, sorry can, Mr Hanson can you uh, put us on hold for, for five minutes please while those discussions take place thank you just to be clear, I can mute you all and put up a test card, um, but the live event still continues, so you won't be able to have conversations over the computer system. Okay, can, can I, I suggest then that Councillor McCann speaks to uh, officers via the phone or other yes. means outside of this, this live meeting. Yes. And I can just remind people to make sure they're muted and the cameras are off while we recess for five minutes. Thank you. Okay, again, welcome back. Apologies for this uh, this little break, but um, obviously things are a little bit easier when we're all in the same room. But we are where we are, so we just have to make do. So, I think we're at a point where... Well, I probably should just bring in Councillor McCann at this point, I think. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay, so having given it consideration, what I'm looking at, um, first of all, what I would say is, in terms of employment, uh, I realise that some members are saying that um, can we get a guarantee of uh, Sefton, um, you know, employees from being taken from within Sefton, and I think for something like this, for um, uh, for such a, uh, a facility as this, you cannot specify that people should be from within a certain area because employment is from by the best candidate and not from a geographical location. So that, that would be my first point about that. However, I, my movement for refusal is on the grounds of failure to meet policy MN8 uh, in that there are insufficient reasons to depart from this policy. Okay, thank you for clarity, Councillor McCann. So that clarifies the reasons for the refusal which has been moved and seconded. I'll second that. Yeah, I think Councillor Tutton has already, but anyway, it's moved and seconded. Uh, Councillor Thompson, would like to come in? Uh, hi, yes, uh, just a couple of things really. Page 44 of the report, it says additional costs to redevelop uh, HMP Kennet. Um, there's two figures there, 3.7 million or 4.6 million. The point I'd like to make is it the report quite clearly states that capital funding has already been agreed at government level, so there is no room for manoeuvre there. And I would also say, is the redevelopment of an old prison the best we can do? It's not a great um, way to build a facility for uh, low level mental health. And the other thing, uh, page 43, I think it is, 
It says uh, economic impact statement uh, claims the construction of the facility would generate 5.2 million for Sefton specifically. But then it says, uh, just to add, um, this is just modest weight to this statement. So can I ask the officer? Well, we're basically being told that there is the possibility of 5.2 million there, but then, you know, it don't add any weight to it. I'm not sure. Is is that basically saying that that report is a bit of a um, uh, wishful thinking? Um, through you, Chair. Um, in terms of the overall plan and assessment, different levels of weight were applied to the different um, distinguishable benefits. Um, if you consider that more than modest weight should be applied to that particular element, then uh, I fully appreciate that. Um, in terms of construction jobs, um, I, I personally apply that level of weight because it's only ever a temporary kind of short term benefit and um, as discussions have um, panned out today, um, if it's, I suppose, if it's not built here, um, it, it, I'd like to think it would still get built, but um, it could possibly be in a different location and then the benefits would just be, you know, kind of um, there anyway in that respect. Um, but it's largely only been applied modest weight because it's just that short term benefit. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Thompson does want to come back and bring him, Councillor O'Brien. Uh, just to add, Chair, that um, the report does say that or indicate there's a strong possibility if it isn't built here, then it just won't happen. And I think that would be, you know, a great shame, really. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor O'Brien. Thanks, Chair. It's just a, a, a quick one. Councillor McCann just said about um, the jobs need to be specialised. Yeah, they do. But this isn't going to be up and running next week. It's, it's going to take, what, two, maybe three years to be built. And, and I get a bit fed up with this glass ceiling for the people in Sefton where you can only go up this high and then that's it. Let's look at what's needed in that facility and get out there and find the people who want to do the training and get them qualified so that when this facility opens, we've got people who are ready to go in and do the jobs. Oh, just my point of view, Chair. No, point well made. Councillor Pullum. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just want to reiterate uh, my objection is about the departure from the development plan of building on the, the land which is protected. And we, we've said, you know, it's we want that land to be as it is for particular reasons. It's not against the bill. It's not against the service. It's not against people's needs. I just not I don't think there's any strong argument why there's any uniqueness. All this has to be built at that location on on Greenland. You know, there is sufficient brownfield sites across the borough where something of that size can be built. Okay, anything further? Mr. McKenzie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd just like to sort of just add a few points before the committee uh, uh, goes to take a vote on this uh, proposal to refuse the application. I just wanted to pick up a few points specifically. Firstly, uh, the quality of the agricultural land has been referred to on a number of occasions. Uh, and although it's high quality agricultural land, the fact that it's safeguarded land means that it was always envisaged that this land was going to be built on, whether that's now or in the future. That's something that needs to be reflected on. Second point is jobs, in that uh, a lot of proposals come forward where jobs are proposed, and it's always a positive aspect of those applications. But 
We can never guarantee that those jobs are going to come forward. It's usually based on the best endeavours of the officer and the agent and the applicants. And uh, as has been put forward by Councillor O'Brien, uh, uh, sometimes we can try and reinforce that uh, to a certain degree with conditions. So yes, there is a leap of faith, but we believe that there will be significant jobs created as a result of this proposal. I also want to touch on the social care side of it and uh, the fact that it has the potential to better benefit the residents of Sefton. But also, we need to think about the consequences of the facility not going forward, mindful that this is the only viable site and the potential harm that could cause to mental health generally in the area and wider. And this committee ha has that to, sort of, to take on board. Also, in this location, there's no justification sequentially to require them to go into Kennet. Uh, and also, as part of a future local plan review, we'd be looking to find how we would uh, allocate the rest of this safeguarded land. But also, it potentially brings into the equation the Kennet site itself as a, a potential housing allocation. We could mitigate the loss of land for housing. And there's far likely to be much more profit in dealing with the demolition and remediation of that land through a housing scheme or a mixed use scheme than simply a healthcare scheme that's limited to, to, to a fixed budget. So I just wanted to bring those items to the committee's attention. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. McKenzie. Councillor Friel, you've indicated. Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, in relation to the employment, uh, could could we leave it to officers to insert something on the lines of that um, contact is made with uh, Sefton at work to, to, to encourage the skills and employment uh, opportunities? Yeah, I think we sort of already uh, agreed okay. that the recommend that the condition would be drafted by officers and it would be in line with what's uh, previously been spoken about. Thank you. Councillor O'Brien, you want to come back in? Thanks, Chair. Um, just, just a little bit of um, sort of insider information. Construction work that's employ local people are very rarely are they made redundant and they're kept on because of the amount of work that local people do and this is I can almost say be able to get the numbers for you if it's needed but that's where we are so yeah, can I just come back about this particular site isn't this hopefully going to be developed into a centre of excellence around mental health where you go from the very mild up to the most serious or from the most serious down to the most mild where you can then be reintroduced to the community and surely in Sefton we could hold this up as this is what should be done because if we if we refuse this and the department of health say well we're not doing it anywhere else because we can't afford it as councillor thompson said there's an allocated amount of money if they say no that's it that's it that's it you either do it in or you don't do it at all the facility that we're losing is it'd be a crying shame Thanks, Chair. No, to Councillor McCann. Thank you, Chair. Um, time's dragging on on this one, I realise that, and I don't want to labour it. Nobody is saying that we don't think that this shouldn't be built um, in, in the area because I agree with what uh, Councillor O'Brien is saying that yes, it will be a centre of excellence. What is being discussed is the fact that Merseycare do not want to build on a brownfield site first. 
they want to build on a greenfield fresh site. And the other thing about the, um, it, it, uh, I think it was Councillor Thompson that said about, uh, is, the, is a disused prison the best we can offer? Well, it's a disused prison, but it wouldn't be a disused prison by the time it had been flattened and made into um, just a, a bare brownfield site. So all this talk about is that the best we can offer, it's not like they're going to be putting a facility in a prison. It won't be a prison. It'll be just the same facility that they want to build now, but on a brownfield site. Uh, the other thing was about glass ceilings for uh, Sefton uh, residents. Nobody's saying that we don't think that there's people in Sefton that could work there. But what I'm saying is you cannot guarantee that or everybody that is going to be employed there will come from Sefton because people can travel. That's all that's being said. So, thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. I've got Councillor Michael O'Brien, Lynn Thompson, uh, Councillor Thompson, and Councillor Brenda O'Brien. Thanks, Chair. It actually says in the report that the uh, Department of Health have said there's no more money. Now, we would all like a Rolls Royce, but we haven't got the money to do it, so we go and buy a Ford Cortina. And the reason why we buy the Ford Cortina is that's what we can afford. And what can be afforded for this facility is what's being proposed here today. Just, just I'm going to shut up, I think. Can you turn on your mic, please, Councillor Thompson? Sorry about that. Uh, just to come back on the point that Councillor McCann made about it wouldn't be a prison because it will be um, regenerated or renovated. It's the it's the position of it as well that uh, you know it actually says on page forty four of the report that given the relative proximity to Ashworth. Uh, and the medium secure units, uh, it just gives the wrong signal out to where, uh, you know, it's it's a low secure uh, unit and it's, it's not supposed to be like a prison, which I, I think it would remain that way. It's the connotation, isn't it, of it being there. And at the present moment, we've got children's social care, which is costing a fortune in Sefton. And adult uh, children, looked after children, has now gone up to the age of 24. So the facility is needed and as soon as possible. Could we just say um, we'll have a percentage of people working from Sefton and do our best to encourage them to do so? Thank you. Sensible suggestion. I'm sure the officers will, if, if it, the motion's carried with the additional condition, I'm sure that'll be enshrined in the condition. 95% uh, chair. Uh, I'm not sure officers will, will agree with that. But, uh, and the other thing, Councillor O'Brien, I'm not sure some members and officers around this table know what a Ford Cortina is. <laughs> anyway, back to the back to the item. Does anyone else want to come in? Because if they don't, we're going to move to the vote. Nope. Okay, so we'll take the motion to refuse first. Yeah, the 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 reasons being clearly uh, stated by Councillor McCann. So we'll we'll go through the Fulton procedure and I'll, I'll look to Mr Hanson to take us through that. Thank you Chair. Councillor Blackburn you are now live please cast your vote. Against. Thank you. 
Councillor Dodd, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Dutton, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Friel, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Kelly, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Against. Thank you. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Councillor McCann, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Or. Thank you. Councillor Brenda O'Brien, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Against. Thank you. Councillor Michael O'Brien, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Against. Thank you. Councillor Pullin, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Oh. <coughs> Sorry, could you repeat that, please? Far. Oh. Thank you, Councillor Pullin. Councillor Roach, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Against. Thank you. Councillor Anne Thompson, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Against. Thank you. Councillor Lynn Thompson, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Against. Thank you. Councillor Tweed, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Against. Thank you. Councillor Waterfield, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Against. Thank you. Councillor Biedman, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Against. Thank you. That concludes the vote, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hanson. I'm going to ask Mr. Kennard to announce the vote. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so the vote is four members for, ten members against, uh, with one abstention. So the motion is not carried. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kennard. So the motion to refuse has fallen. So we're left with the recommendation contained in the report with the additional condition regarding employment to be drafted by officers. So we'll now go through the process with Mr. Hansen to vote on the recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Blackburn, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Dodd, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Against. Thank you. Councillor Dutton, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Against. Thank you. Councillor Friel, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Kelly, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor McCann, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Against. Thank you. Councillor Brenda O'Brien, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Michael O'Brien, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Pullin, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Against. 
Thank you. Council Roach, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Anne Thompson, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Lynn Thompson, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Tweed, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Thank you. Councillor Waterfield, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Beedman, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you, Chair. That concludes the voting process. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. And again, I'll ask our legal advisor, Mr. Kennard, to announce the vote. Thank you, Chair. Um, on that vote, uh, there were 10 for, four against, and one abstention. So the motion carried subject to the additional condition. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Kennard. So that is approved, subject to the additional condition and the conditions contained in the report. We'll move on to item 5C, which relates to land at the side and rear of Goals, Liverpool North, 151 Park Lane in Netherton. And I'll ask Mr. Swan please to present this item for us. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, this is an agenda item 5C. It can be found on pages 57 to 82 of the main agenda. And the plans and photographs are on pages 181 to 180 within ag agenda item 7D. There's also some late representations on page 15 of the supplementary agenda. For clarification, I'd just like you to turn to um, page 15 of the supplementary agenda and just look at the bottom of the page. I'll just give you a second to find that. Um, it's just that there's a couple of words have been obscured by the page 15 um, logo. So it should actually say clarity in dealing with development on playing pitches. So I just wanted to clarify that point. OK, so this is a full application. It's for residential development of 149 affordable homes comprising 91 houses and 58 apartments on land to the side and rear of the Goals Soccer Centre on Park Lane, Netherton. Consultation responses can be found on pages 60 to 61 of the agenda and third party representations are summarised on page 62. The main issues to consider are the principle of the development, its visual impact and the effects on living conditions, highway safety and ecology, as well as Section 106 requirements. With regards to the principle, the site is designated open space and was last used as playing pitches around 10 years ago. It's now disused and overgrown. It's understood the current owner has no plans to bring the pitches back into use. The most practical solution is, is considered to be a financial contribution to compensate for the loss of the pitches. The applicant and Sport England have agreed to a financial contribution of £190,000, which can be secured through a legal agreement and will fund improvements to playing pitches in the area. While Sport England wish to agree the precise scheme to be funded before the application is determined, this is not considered practical. Sport England have been informed of the committee report and its recommendation and have acknowledged this. The proposal complies with local plan policy NH5 
on open space, as it will ensure that the loss of playing pitches will be replaced by equivalent or better provision in terms of quality and quantity in a suitable location. The scheme is for affordable housing, which will meet a local need and make a valuable contribution towards the borough's housing supply. For the above reasons, the principle of the development is accepted. The visual impact of the two storey houses is in character with the surrounding residential area, whilst the scale of the three storey apartment block on the Dunningsbridge Road frontage is in keeping with commercial development along this major route. With regards to living conditions, any disturbance to existing residents during the construction phase can be minimised by a condition requiring a construction environmental management plan. Separation distances between new and existing houses and within the site itself all, all exceed the minimum standards set out in Sefton's guidance. Sizes of flats and garden sizes for the new dwellings are all in accordance with the guidance. With regards to noise, the applicant has submitted noise reports which have been appraised by the Environmental Health Manager. Noise inside the buildings can be mitigated by measures such as acoustic glazing and covered by condition. Acoustic barriers are proposed to the south and west of the existing sports pitches to protect the new homes from activity noise. Whilst it is accepted that some of the outdoor space for the flats will be less attractive to residents to use, the applicant has agreed to install some acoustic fencing to the sides of the building to minimise traffic impacts and to improve the usability of the spaces with additional planting. The areas of private outdoor amenity space are considered acceptable in terms of quantity and quality. On to highway safety, the proposed access to the site is from Park Lane and is the existing access to the Goals facility. A transport assessment submitted with the application and appraised by the Highways Manager and Highways England has demonstrated the access will operate safely. The number of car parking spaces proposed is 237, which is below Sefton standard but is considered acceptable in this case. The development is close to designated sites of ecological importance. An appropriate assessment under the habitats regulations has been carried out. This concludes that with suitable mitigation, no adverse impact on the designated sites will occur. The mitigation measures will help to reduce recreational pressure on the Sefton coast and will be secured by condition and within the legal agreement. The Section 106 legal agreement will secure the affordable housing required by planning policy, which in this case is a minimum of 5% of the homes for affordable or social rent, that's eight units, and 10% for affordable home ownership, which is 15 units and includes rent to buy and shared ownership. Financial contributions for the loss of playing pitches and for the recreational pressure on the coast will also be secured as will a maintenance agreement for the areas of open spaces within the site. To conclude, the report demonstrates that the proposal is acceptable in principle and will make a valuable contribution to Sefton's housing supply and provide 100% affordable housing. It is acceptable in terms of all of the planning considerations. While some harms have been identified, suitable measures have been put in place to mitigate these impacts. The balanced view is that any harm resulting from the development is not sufficient to outweigh the benefits of the scheme and approval is recommended subject to a legal agreement and the condition listed on page 72 to 80 of the agenda. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for asking, one, please. Council, question for Diane. Humphreys, if you don't mind, please, Chair. Councillor Kelly, have you got your camera on? Yes, yeah, I have. Just yeah. turned off now. That's okay. okay. Councillor Kelly. Diane, the um, the uh, the affordable. Is this all going to be uh, concentrated in the apartments and is, you know, the apartment block? Are they all affordable or social? 
Yeah, so the, the whole development, the houses and the apartments, they're all affordable. It's 100% affordable housing throughout the scheme. Yeah, um, yeah, but um, are the, the apartments, uh, the social elements, not the affordable, are they just the social elements, social housing? So the application is for 100% um, affordable housing. What what the policy requires? So, uh, I mean, yeah, the applicant. I'm sorry, Diane. What I'm trying to say is, you know, affordable. Your affordable might be different to my affordable, but I'm talking about the social housing, i.e., primarily all for rent. Are they all the apartments just all for rent, or are they for sale? Okay, so the application in their plan, the applicant in their planning statement says it's 100% affordable, but it will be split between affordable rent, rent to buy, and shared ownership. Okay, so then we've got our policy on affordable housing that requires, in this case, um, a minimum of 15 of the units to be affordable home ownership. Um, so that that includes rent to buy and shared ownership. Now we can't say which units that this will be because it would be um, what would happen is it would be, depend on the waiting list priority at the time of occupation. So it's the needs of you know the people who are on the priority waiting list that would decide which unit or. or the tenures would all, you know, the quality of the homes is all the same throughout. And they're, they're all affordable, they, but they're, they're just slightly different types of affordable homes. Thank you, Chair. So, so, Diane, there's no social housing. There's no social housing on this at all. There's just affordable housing. There's no social for rent. <clears throat> Through you, Chair. Uh, yeah, there is. It does include um, affordable rent as well, social and, and affordable rent. For throughout the whole of the development, throughout the whole of the development, or prime just the uh, apartments. It, it's the whole of the development. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thank Diane. You. Okay, I've got Michael Bryan, Councillor Michael Bryan, and then Mr. McKenzie. Thanks, Chair. Um, Mrs. Humphreys, can, can you give us a better explanation about the private outdoor amenity space, especially for the um, apartments, flats? Is, is that above the minimum? And if so, by how much? Okay, yeah, thanks. Through you, Chair. So, there's, there's, there are various areas of outdoor amenity space around the flats. Um, there's a total of around about 1,800 square metres. The policy requirement is for 1,160 square metres. Now, I accept that the areas at the front you know, fronting onto Dunnings Bridge Road, they might not be so attractive for residents to maybe sit out in because of potential traffic noise. So what we've agreed with the applicants is that they will put some extra acoustic fence either side of the apartment block so that it will uh, minimise impact of traffic noise to the side areas of the communal open space. And the, the two areas of communal open space to the sides of the flat, so these will be, you know, will have less of traffic noise and be more private and usable. They total around 1300 square meters, which does still exceed the 1160 requirement. And in, in addition to that, there are some other bits of open space um, and I, th I think another concern was that maybe they were 
too narrow, but it, it, it's hard to see from the, the scale of the plans, but they actually measure the width of the um, side areas of communal space. The area on the west is about 16 metres wide and the area on the east is about seven and a half metres wide. So, so they are considered to be usable areas of open space. Thank you, Chair. Michael, come back to you. On the same point, yeah. Yeah, it, it is the same point. I'm looking at the plan, I don't know whether which is east, west or what, but the bit when you're looking at uh, Dunnersbridge Road to the um, right of the, the apartments, that's um, an extremely long, thin, well overlooked um, area, isn't it? So is that classed as linear? Because if it's linear, you can't have that as private outdoor amenity space, can you? Um, through you, Chair. That, so that that um, that area is to the east. It's next to the pictures, isn't it? That is seven and a half meters wide. So that is considered to be, you know, a usable amount of open space. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, can, I, can I just come back? Can, can we have? A definition of what linear is, as far as I understood, it was long and thin, and that's long and thin, and that's linear. Okay, I'm, I'm going to bring Mr McKenzie in now, or maybe Mr McKenzie would like to comment on the, the linear point as well. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, if I can just go back to the point raised by Councillor Kelly uh, and to sort of supplement the response that was given by the case officer. Uh, we can put a condition on this uh, to make sure that the, the social aspect, as, as was referred to by Councillor Kelly, uh, is mixed throughout the site and that there's no concentration of any one particular category. Uh, so to, that's really to sort of assure him that, that we will make sure that that's covered as part of the, the approval. We can put a condition on. In terms of the uh, linear uh, definition, we, we have a, a, a supplementary planning document uh, that talks about uh, amenity spaces, et cetera. And generally, we, we would n consider anything that's sort of under two meters in width uh, as not something that we would include as part of the amenity space calculations. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. McKenzie. Councillor Roach. Hi, yes. Um, I'm a bit concerned that I can't see any tree uh, officer's report, uh, and there's no definition of which trees have been felled or retained. Oh, does anybody know? You can see them on the map you've provided but they're not, there's nothing mentioned about them are they, are they, a lot of those trees are very mature are they being retained thank you yeah thanks through you chair um there is a landscape plan as part of your pack yet the trees are protected around the perimeter and some of them are being removed and um, I'll, I'll give you the page number sorry it's anyway it's it's the third plan and it's after the site layout there's a landscape master plan some of the trees are to be removed but the tree officer has has stated that that is acceptable it's just um sort of good management of the existing trees. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Mrs. Hull, please. Councillor Tutton. Hi, thanks, Chair. 
Um, I'm just looking at the, where the apartments are uh, situated, and I, and I can see a bin storage area, but it doesn't actually look very big. For 58 apartments, that does not actually look very big. And secondly, I can't see anywhere, and forgive me if I've just missed it, uh, but I can't see anywhere where you've got um, cycle provision, any provision for cycling, uh, like storage, etc. I'm sorry if I've missed it, but I just can't see it. Could I just have a bit of clarification, please? Yeah, through you, Chair. Yeah, the cycle store um, is actually within the building, so you can't see it on the, it's within the ground floor plans of the apartments, which aren't part of the pack, I'm sorry, but cycle storage is within the building. Thank you, Chair. Councillor McCann. Sorry, Chair. Sorry, Chair, could I just go back on the uh, um, the bin storage? Is is that considered adequate for that number of um, um, apartments? Please. Probably Greg Martin, I would think. By all means, Mr Martin, if you, if you want to comment, I'm not sure whether... Sorry, Chair. Um, the, the, the bin store element isn't um, an area um, that I have any sort of expertise over, unfortunately. Um, I don't know whether Diane may be able to point out um, the, the, the appropriate size for, for the bin store. Um. Through you, Chair, I'd, I'd have to, you know, take a minute to just look at the plans and. OK, that's tell you. I mean, yeah, yeah, I don't have that to hand. OK, I'll bring you in. Thank you, Chair. Um, just want to ask uh, Diane. Um, 58 apartments. I'm just wondering how many parking spaces for cars there are. Um, I don't know what is there a policy on number of car parking spaces per apartment. I'm not sure how the perhaps you could just clarify how big these apartments are. Are they uh, one bed, two bed? Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure about that, but. I don't know whether there's a policy for number of car parking spaces and whether how many parking spaces there are allocated to the uh, um, the apartment block. Okay, should we bring in Mr. Page to answer the car parking issue, and then we bring Mr. Humphries back in. Thank you, Chair. Right, I'll just adjust my background. That's what happens when you lose the connection. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, we obviously have a uh, planning document um, about uh, sustainable travel and development, which includes uh, parking standards within it. And we've assessed the whole of the development against those standards, both in terms of the parking that's provided for the apartment block and the parking that is provided uh, for the individual properties. Um, as um, Mrs. Humphreys mentioned in her report, there's a total of 237 car park spaces. I'd, I'd just have to find out what the balance between the two is, but from my recollection, the parking provision for the apartment block was in accordance with the standards that we uh, have in our supplementary planning guidance. The parking provision in the range of properties is slightly below, which is why the overall total is slightly under the total if you added them all up together. But 
the information provided by the developer in relation to car ownership and the uh, accessibility assessment that they provided meant that we were willing to accept that um, volume of parking uh, as acceptable in this case. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. That, Mr. Baird. Mrs. Humphrey, is it you? Are you ready on the, the bin issue? No, I'm not. Sorry, I'm still hunt trawling through the plans. Okay, um, so I'll bring you Councillor Paul and then. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, a question for Mrs. Humphrey. I think I know where this is. I just want some clarification on the plan. Uh, the part of the site, I think where the apartments are, but that's irrelevant to the question really, it refers to the whole site, is pedestrian and cycle access onto Dunbridge Bridge Road itself. I believe there's a cycle track down there, the site's close to two, uh, a bus lay by and I think it's a bridge further up the road. Is How would residents of that site actually gain access by foot or bicycle to Dunbridge Bridge Road? Oh. Yeah, I can answer that one. There is a pedestrian um, access through on the, say, the top left-hand corner of the of the site layout that that takes pedestrians out onto Dunnings Bridge Road. Thank you. Can I come back on that, please, Chair? Yeah, thanks for calling. Would I be right in thinking that that? entrance exit to the site is actually further away from the corner on the eastern side to where people are likely to need to walk to access the bridge. I just think it might be doing a long route of walking, whereas having the access closer to where the bridges are and the, the, which you need to use the bridge to get over the road to use the bus stop. I'm just wondering if any consideration could be made for that. I'm just wondering if could would Mr. Birch be able to help with this? I'm still trying to work out the size of the bin still. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, obviously the, the developer has put that forward as a proposal. Um, it connects into a uh, footway, cycleway that goes down the, the side of the site. The, the other end of the site, I think you're quite correct, would be closer to the uh, footbridge over uh, close to the Park Lane Junction. Um, we've it, it meets the accessibility requirements. That doesn't mean it couldn't be better. So um, I think we would be quite happy to talk to the developer if you felt that that was a more appropriate location to look at what options they would have for providing that. Um, I think part of the reason for doing that is that there is a an existing connection I think there from what I recall and they're looking to make use of that but we can certainly talk to them about an alternative or maybe even an additional provision because actually the best option will be to have access in both locations. Thank you Chair. Yeah thanks I, I was going to suggest that uh, if it's possible could we have both because uh, I think if you only have one or the other I think people's natural desire lines will determine there will be entrance and exits push through the trees as people would want and perhaps having something a bit more formal might make it look a bit better in the long term. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, that's sensible, Councillor Paul, and that's noted. I'm sure Mr. Birch will take that up with the case officer and the applicants. Uh, Councillor Dutton. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, first of all, are we able to go any further with the bin storage? And secondly, you say about having um, cycle storage within the actual apartment block. How many cycles are you catering for within that block? Because I can't, again, I can't see it. I can see in the report 
you're saying about uh, adequate adequate. Um, uh, I can't find it now. A cycle parking is required for the apartments in line with the guidance on sustainable travel and development. But you're not saying how many um, cycle um, units there will be contained within that apartment block. If I could have clarification on that as well, please. Through you, Chair. Yeah, I'm just doing some measurements. Uh, so the bin store measures approximately 8.7 by 6.7 metres. Um, the cycle store is about 7.7 .7 by 5.4 metres. Um, I mean, the cycle store has been, you know, the highways manager has, has accepted the cycle uh, provision. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Diane, uh, and thanks for the clarification on the cycle storage. Um, if that's been OK, that's OK. I still feel that um, the the bin sit, uh, site doesn't seem very big for uh, that number of apartments. It might be worth looking at again. Just a, just a thought. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Okay, I'm sure, again, that's noted. Councillor O'Brien. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just a couple of questions for Mr. Birch. Um, sort of flipped over. Um, the number of parking spaces on this development is below Sefton's minimum. So here we go again. We have a minimum. And we're quite prepared to go below it. When what we should be saying is, uh, uh, never ever below that. And the other one is, how's this? How's the junction of Park Lane and um, Church Road going to cope? Where's it up to on capacity? Thank you, Councillor. Through you, Chair. Um, yeah, just to respond quickly on, on the parking, this was something that we had quite a lot of discussion with the developer about. We, we pushed quite hard um, on that. Um, what they have, are now proposing is amounts to a total of, I think it's about 93% of our expectations, which is guidance. Obviously, it, it's, um, it's not uh, imposed in that sense. We try to provide it as guidance, but we do expect that they would meet that. They have made a case as to, because of the uh, proximity of bus routes and the railway station and the car ownership in this area, they have made a, a case why they, sh why they can uh, provide slightly below that standard. Um, because it is only just below, in, in this case, we were prepared to accept that. Um, coming on to the issue of the, the junction, this was something that we did have a lot of concerns about and we've had a lot of uh, discussion about um, both with ourselves, with the developers uh, consultant and also with Highways England and their consultants. The junction at uh, Park Lane and Dunnage Bridge Road or Church Road, um, <clears throat> it's uh, on, as you'll be aware, it's, it's on the trunk road, so it's part of Highways England's network. So they have the primary responsibility as the highway authority for that uh, area, but Sefton Council um, operates the traffic signals at that junction under a contract with them. Those traffic signals uh, are optimised using a, a computer system called Scoot, and that has detectors in each of the approaches to the junction. It detects where there are queues and it allocates uh, the green time accordingly to try and optimise the number of vehicles that go through the junction and, and reduce the queues. However, Park Lane, as, as we know, um, is subject to very large volumes uh, of traffic at that junction, particularly along the Church Road section. So uh, there will be times when you, you will get queues building up. Um, the 
developers consultants have, have done an assessment. They've done some specific junction modelling that has been scrutinised both by Highways England and by ourselves. They uh, consider that the junction based on the modelling that they've done operates within capacity. Both ourselves and Highways England have concerns that that suggests that things are a little bit better than, than they actually are and that the junction does operate over capacity at times. Um, we work on a, a figure generally of about 85% saturation as being equivalent to its operational capacity and at peak times that junction is operating at 94 to 95% saturation on some of the arms which is why uh, you get the queuing building up. So, so it is a challenge as to whether that junction is going to cope um, with any additional traffic. Obviously, the, the tra traffic from the site, some of it will go north out of, along Park Lane to that junction. Other traffic will head south and the developers consultant have, have done an assessment of that. Um, what we've reached the point of is uh, having to make a decision as to whether that additional traffic would constitute a severely detrimental impact on the highway network. Highways England and their consultants have concluded that although they still have uh, concerns about it, that they concluded it wouldn't be a severely detrimental impact on the performance of the junction and for that reason they withdrew their objection. Um, our assessment obviously is affected by um, what Highways England's conclusion is as well and we've reached effectively the same conclusion. There will be some impacts but they're not sufficiently severe for us to justify a refusal on highways grounds. Thank you Chair. Thank you Mr Birch. Councillor McCann. Thank you Chair. Um, just picking up on a, on a similar theme really, um, there was talk uh, a while ago that Dunningsbridge Road, was, which obviously is no, uh, notorious for um, very heavy traffic as, as, uh, as Mr Birch has just said, um, there was talk about the possibility of doing some widening or some remodelling of, the, of uh, Dunningsbridge Road. I wonder whether Highways England have, have um, alluded to anything that might happen in the future. I, I know we've got the Liverpool One, uh, Rimrose Valley Road, but um, I'm just wondering if there's anything possible in the future. But mainly, what well, the point I want to come to um, is the pollution aspect, because quite a lot of the time there is uh, standing traffic, very slow moving traffic, and um, I think the Dunningsbridge Road area is, is noted as being one of the most uh, highly polluted. So I, I just want to basically clarify about whether the Dunningsbridge Road in terms of traffic and remodelling, whether there's a possibility of that, and in terms of um, uh, highway pollution, and uh, whether you're basically building some apartments that are just going to be uh, completely gassed out at times. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so bring in Mr. Birch on the first point and then bring in Mr. Martin on the second point, maybe. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Um, we're, we're not aware of any um, proposals to make modifications to, to Dunnagewood Road or Church Road at the moment. Um, other than the proposals to replace the footbridge at Park Lane, which you may be aware of, um, part of the reason for replacing the footbridge is that the um, provision for at-grade crossings to allow pedestrians to cross at-grade um, there was no space or, or, or uh, ability within the, the performance of the traffic signal junction to allow that time for pedestrians. So uh, Highways England have a, a programme in place to replace the footbridge. Um, but other than that, I'm not aware of any other proposals to modify either widening or otherwise uh, of Church Road, Dunningbridge Road. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Birch. Uh, thank you, Chair. On the uh, uh, quality issues raised by Councillor McCann, um, we, we do undertake 
uh, monitoring in the vicinity of the application site. Um, and what we're finding, um, roadside levels of uh, air pollution can be quite high, um, but when um, you move away from the roadside, uh, the levels reduce uh, quite substantially. So the monitoring that we're actually undertaking at the moment monitors level levels at the nearest residential or sensitive uh, premises. And what we're finding is uh, levels in that area at the, the nearest residential locations are within national standards. Um, in agreement with, with Councillor McCann, we we're obviously concerned about the impact uh, of air quality on the uh, residential, uh, the future residential occupiers of the flats. So we required a, a detailed air quality assessment to be undertaken uh, and that's been done and submitted as, in, in support of the application. Uh, we reviewed the detailed assessment, uh, which is uh, undertaken modelling to determine the levels of air pollution um, on the uh, development site. Uh, and the modelling has shown that all levels um, of pollutants at all locations within the development site are within national standards. Uh, so from that, that point of view, we believe that air quality levels will be considered acceptable within the, the development site. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Mr. Martin. Councillor O'Brien. Thanks, Chair. Just a, uh, a couple of quick ones for uh, Mr. Martin um, and, and also for Mrs. Humphreys. We'll, we'll look on that. Uh, A, a program to put new trees in. Are there any trees that help to absorb pollution? And if there is, can we insist on that is what's getting used? And the other one for Mr. Martin, you're saying you're checking on the site where the pollution is, but you can't take into consideration or have you the amount of cars that have been driving around on that site when it's occupied? which increases the pollution. Uh, through, through you, Chair. Uh, in terms of, of trees, I, I, I'm not a, an expert in that particular subject, uh, but obviously trees do absorb uh, carbon dioxide and uh, they do have an effect on capturing um, particulates um, and, and can act as some form of barrier uh, against other pollutants. Um, I'm, I'm not aware um, of any particular species that's better than others in doing that. That, that may be something we can look into if, if uh, that's helpful. Uh, in terms of the other point raised by Councillor O'Brien, um, we we have, uh, the, the report has considered the impact of traffic associated with the development, both within the, the, the development area and the impact of that uh, future additional traffic on the road network. Um, the assessment has concluded that that, that impact is, is negligible and, and won't unduly affect air quality levels. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks. Um, through you, Chair, if I can just add a little bit to what Mr Martin's just said. I mean, um, the, the plans do show that there is additional planting, quite a lot of additional planting across the site proposed. Um, we have got a condition 25 for us to agree the details um, of that landscaping. I. I also don't know which trees or if there are certain trees that absorb more CO2 than others, but can certainly discuss with our, well, we would consult anyway our, with our tree officer on the landscaping scheme and I can specifically, you know, um, we can specifically require that if it is, you know, if it is possible. Thank you, Chair. 
Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Friel. Yeah, it, this is a concern that I have along the, that particular corridor, Dunwich Bridge Road. Um, I know that Highways England has looked at uh, putting in some kind of uh, living uh, wall or barrier uh, down, at, down, down at the uh, dock end of uh, that road. Is it possible to, uh, for, for this committee in some way to have a, a record of its concern about the impact of traffic on there and that uh, officers could examine alternatives in addition to trees? Uh, such as a, a, a living barrier. Um, I've, I've seen it, that it's being utilised, um, but perhaps that's some, something that without being too prescriptive, we could just put in um, as a record. You know, you know very well, Chair, and I'm sure a number of the committee members do, the great deal of community concern there is about any additional road traffic or junctions that would connect onto that highway? Yeah, I, th I think that's uh, why the express concern comes to the, the issue for uh, development is whatever we ask the developers do has to be proportionate to the development. So I'm not sure the cost of living walls and uh, moss banks and stuff like that, but I'm sure the officers have noted that and, you know, will explore with developers other options other than trees, albeit trees are a good, uh, a good method of, of alleviating pollution. Is there anybody else who wants to come in? No. Okay. Can I move the recommendation, Chair? Uh, where are we? Move the recommendation, Chair. With the uh, conditions and the extra condition regarding the social elements uh, subject and subject to the completion of a Section 106 agreement. And I second that, Chair. Okay, that's that's very clear. It's moved and seconded. If there's nothing else, we move to a vote. Chair Diana Humphreys wish to speak. No. Sorry, Mr. Humphreys, you wanted to come in. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just wanted to make a, a point about the um, affordable homes and the tenure mix. What normally happens is um, through the Section 106 agreement, the applicant um, agrees with us the actual tenure mix across the site. So that is an option to consider that we would um, agree the tenure mix across the site through that. I just also, but I just need to point out there's no actual policy requirement for pepper potting different types of tenures. Um, when it's a 100% affordable home scheme, the pepper potting only comes into consideration when there's market homes on the site. Okay, thanks, Chair. Okay, noted, Mr. Humphries. The mover and the seconder of the motion, the recommendation. Uh, are you still happy to move what you just moved? Yes, Chair. Yes, Chair. So on that basis, can't see anyone else indicating. I'll ask Mr Hanson to take us to a vote. I ask members to indicate for, against or abstention, please. Four. 
Four. Thank you. I was just thinking, I'm, I'm not happy about the traffic, but I'm four. Councillor Kelly, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor McCann, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Brenda O'Brien, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Thank you. Councillor Michael O'Brien, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Pullin, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Roach, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, you, could you please unmute your mic and cast your vote? You're now Four. live. Thank you. Councillor Lynn Thompson, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Tweed, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Waterfield, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Vegan, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. That concludes the voting process. Okay, thank you for that. Mr. Hanson, I'll ask Mr. Kennard to announce the vote. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the vote was 15 for unanimous. The motion carried subject to the extra condition and the 106. Thank you. For that. So that is approved subject to the conditions and the signing of a section 106 agreement. <coughs> and we move straight on. Item 5D, this relates to Albers Croft, 8 Blundell Sands Road, East in Crosby. And Mr Mackey, are you going to present this report for us? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. For ease of reference, the report for the application begins at page 83 of this agenda, with plans and photographs set out on pages 181 to 196. The application site is at Ulvis Croft, 8 Blundell Sands Road, East Crosby, the location of which is shown on page 182 of the agenda, with context photographs following across the next three pages. The application is seeking consent for conversion of the existing dwelling house to 13 self-contained apartments, including a two-storey extension to the right-hand side of the building, single-storey extension to the rear of the building, and associated vehicular access, off-street car parking, and a mixture of hard and soft landscaping. As seen from the provided plans and photographs, the site lies at the corner of Blundersands Road East and Kenilworth Road within a primarily residential area of Crosby. The summary of objections received from five properties in the immediate area are set out on pages 86 and 87 in the agenda. The objectors raise concerns over non-compliance with the local plan, the overdevelopment of the site, the detrimental impact on the character of the area with extensions not in keeping with the existing building. The proposal will overlook and otherwise cause harm to living conditions of neighbouring properties the negative impact on highway safety and immunity, and the loss of trees. The proposed site plan, elevations and floor plans for this proposal are set out within pages 186 to 195 of the agenda. As set out on page 88 of the agenda, the main issues considered in, considered in the assessment of this proposal are the principle of development, the impact on the character of the area, the living conditions to be provided to future occupiers, the impact on the living conditions of neighbouring properties, 
and the impact on highway safety and immunity. Given that this site is within a designated primarily residential area, then local plan policy HC3 allows for residential development so long as it, as it is consistent with other local plan policies. Following the receipt of amended plans for the elevations, it is considered for the reasoning set out in pages 88 to 90, with page 89 showing the comparison between as submitted and now as amended, that the proposal is appropriate within the context of this area. As demonstrated within pages 90 and 91, an assessment has been undertaken of the living conditions to be provided to future occupiers. The proposal will, save for a constrained outlook to the basement flat labels as apartment three, be sufficient in this regard. The shortfall in outlook from apartment three must therefore be considered as part of the planning balance. In respect of the impacts on the living conditions of neighbouring properties, it is considered that the proposal complies with relevant policies and guidance, as justified within pages 91 to 93 of this agenda. The highways manager raises no objection to this proposal, and as such, subject to conditions, it is considered that the proposal is acceptable with regards to impacts on highway safety and immunity. To conclude, the planning balance for this application is laid out on pages 94 and 95 of the agenda, setting out the weight to be given to relevant matters. The conclusion of this is that the contribution to Sefton's housing supply, along with economic benefits arising from construction and subsequent occupation, outweigh the harm to the living conditions of future occupiers of apartment three. The comments of the objectors, insofar as they relate to material considerations, are noted but they are not sufficient to justify the refusal of this application. Therefore, this application is recommended for approval subject to the 12 conditions listed on pages 96 to 98. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you for that, Mr Mackey. Over to members, any comments or questions? Councillor Dutton. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, good report there, Mr Mackey, but I'm, I'm just a little bit concerned as to the number of parking spaces. Would it be possible for uh, Mr Birch to just um, clarify that there are sufficient there for the number of apartments, please? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dutton. Yeah, we, we have a mixture of, uh, as far as I understand, two bedroom and one bedroom flats and a couple of studio apartments. Uh, on that basis, uh, and given the site's proximity to the railway station, we're satisfied that the 15 parking spaces, which is one per apartment plus uh, two for provision for disabled spaces is, is sufficient uh, and will meet the needs of the development. So we're satisfied that that is acceptable. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Mr. Birch. Cheers. Thank you. Councillor O'Brien. Thanks, Chair. It's um... Looking at the plans, is the sufficient private outdoor amenity space for the number of apartments that are there? Because looking at it, there's some of it that you can say would be private, and some of it is actually very, very linear. Through you, Chair, if I may. I've heard the linear discussions relating to previous applications, so hopefully I've got a head start on this. We could argue that a linear space could be 100 metres by 300 metres, where it's longer than it is wide. 
So linear, by being a definition in and of itself, isn't sufficient to discount areas of open space. In the assessment of the landscaping area, we have actually discounted areas that the applicant sought to include because they were not private, nor do we believe they were usable, particularly that square of land next to the two car parking spaces. And I'll give you some directions into the agenda. If you bear with me one moment. So on on page 186 of the agenda, so we're all looking at the same page. There's no distinction drawn by the agent about the open space to the left hand side as you're looking to the two disabled car parking spaces. However, we have discounted that because it's not private. The remaining area between the main building and the boundary wall and from the disabled spaces to the three remaining car parking spaces is wider and deeper than the majority of gardens in terraced areas in the immediate area, so in the immediate vicinity. Distances are eight to nine metres in width, varying upon the distance of the bay windows and other projections. The spaces are well contained, they're well laid out and they are usable. I understand Councillor O'Brien's view as to whether or not the linear, we have discounted strips of land to the left hand side of the building. We have discounted strips of land to the front of the building and what remains to the right hand side and to the rear is private, usable and exceeds the minimum requirements as set out within the SPD. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Mackey. If there's nothing further, I don't think there is, we'll move to vote on this. Mr. Hansen, do you want to take us through the vote? Councillor Blackburn, you on our live, please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Dodd, you on our live, please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Dutton, you on our live, please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Friel, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Kelly, can you please turn on your camera? I will go to Councillor McCann and pick up Councillor Kelly afterwards. Councillor McCann, can you please cast your vote? Four. Thank you. Councillor Brenda O'Brien, can you please cast your vote? Four. Thank you. Councillor Michael O'Brien, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Pullin, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Roach, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Oh. Thank you. Councillor Anne Thompson, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Oh. Thank you. Councillor Lynn Thompson, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Tweed, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Waterfield, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you.
Councillor Veedman, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Okay. And just going to ask for a another call out for Councillor John Kelly. Can you please turn on your camera, Councillor Kelly? Mr. Hanson, I think Councillor Kelly's just having some IT issues, connection problems, so uh, I'm not sure he'll be able to respond. Okay. Okay. Well, that will conclude the vote. If Councillor Kelly can hear me, can unmute his mic because I can see him still connected. Okay. No, it's not like he's unmuted his mic. Perhaps he can't hear. Okay, that concludes the vote then. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Hanson. Mr. Kennard, would you like to announce the vote, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, so the vote is 14 for with one councillor member not partaking. So the motion passed as per officer recommendation. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. So that is approved as laid out in the report. That brings us to item 5E on the agenda. This relates to 86 Mill Lane in Southport. There's two applications on the agenda relating to this property. The first application, item 5A. I'd ask committee to defer this item for further consultation. The committee of the... the Agreed. Okay, Agreed. thank you. There doesn't seem to be any dispute, any uh, dissent, so we'll move Agreed. on. That's deferred. Thank you for that. Brings us to item 5F. This again, stated relates to 86 Mill Lane in Southport. And Mr. Baker, are you going to introduce this report for us? Yes, thank you, Chair. Chair, th th this application rates to number 86 Mill Lane in Southport, as he just, just raised, uh, and seeks a variation of a planning condition attached to a former application on the property. For ease, the report is at page 107 of the agenda, and the plans and photographs for this application can be found at item 7F, and that's at pages 197 to 206 of the agenda. In terms of the application property, you will note, Chair, from the photographs that it's a two-storey house that has been extended, located within a primarily residential. A telephone exchange sits immediately north of the property with houses surrounding all of the boundaries. The site does not sit within a conservation area, but it does sit on the boundary of Church Town Conservation Area. As you'll be, a, be aware, Chair and members, uh, plan of permission was granted in 2018 for various extensions to the property and the erection of a detached garage in the rear garden. The previous, the previous approval proposed a simple brick material pallet to the rear and side walls of the extension, which was controlled by condition. The proposed application seeks to vary this condition so as not to, so as to have rendered the finish instead of. Um, Similar to that previously approved in February 2020, which you will all be also aware of, um, but with the addition of render on the remaining portion of the side of the house. And Chair, those changes can be viewed on pages 199 of the agenda. No objections have been received on this application. And so the key issue to consider is the impact on the of the material amendments to the house extensions onto the character of the area, particularly the setting of the adjacent conservation area. In this regard, Chair, it is considered that the proposed amendments would be acceptable and it is therefore recommended that the application be approved subject to the conditions stated in the agenda. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Mr. Baker. Any comments on the report? Michael O'Brien. Councillor O'Brien. Thanks, Chair. Just a quick one for Mr. Baker. None of the other conditions that were put in place have changed at all, have they? 
the, the ones we had before. The only condition that we're changing is to go to render, isn't it? Jay, yes, through you. In terms of the conditions, none of the conditions uh, have changed since the 2018 planning commission. That's correct. So it's just the approved conditions or the approved plans condition that has changed uh, in relation to referring to the most recent amendment. The plan. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair. In relation to that, can I move um, approval of the recommendation then, Chair? Seconded. Okay, that's Agreed. moved. Seconded. There's nothing further. We'll move to the vote. Mr. Hansen, can you take us through the vote? Councillor Blackburn, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Oh. Councillor Dodd has declared an interest and will not vote on this item. <laughs> Councillor Dutton, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Oh. Thank you. Councillor Friel. Can you please turn on your camera? Certainly. Four. You are now live. Please cast your vote, Councillor Friel. Like the golfer said, four. Thank you. Councillor Kelly, have you managed to sort out your connection problems? No. I'll move to Councillor McCann. Councillor McCann, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Brenda O'Brien, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Thank you. Councillor Michael O'Brien, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Pullin, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Oh. Thank you. Councillor Roach, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Oh. Thank you. Councillor Ann Thompson, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Oh. Thank you. Councillor Lynn Thompson, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Tweed, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Waterfield, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. Councillor Beedman, you are now live. Please cast your vote. Four. Thank you. I'll just give one last check to see whether Councillor Kelly is available. No, he seems like he still has IT problems. Well, that concludes the vote, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Mr. Kennard, over to you. Have the vote. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the votes for are 13 with two members not taking part in the vote, so the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennard. So that is approved with conditions. That brings us to item six on the agenda. Relates to plan and appeals. If there are no comments, we'll take that as noted as per the recommendation. Unless Mr Matthews, you, you're burning to come in. Oh, thanks. OK, just for information then, we didn't obviously can't do physical visits at the moment, but we did conduct a virtual site visit 
session at 10 o'clock on Monday morning on the 29th of June. That's just for information. And that just leaves me to thank members for their attendance and to thank officers who have facilitated and made this happen today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That ends the live event. Thank you.